in compelling circumstances, such as a once-in-a-century global pandemic. Under the Trump administration, listen to these numbers. The Bureau of Prisons denied all but 36, 36 of 31,000 31, compassionate release petitions filed during the pandemic. In the first six months of the Biden administration, the Bureau of Prisons approved just nine compassionate release requests. This is extraordinary. When the infection rate in the Bureau of Prisons was six to seven times the national infection rate and the death rate equally appalling, when compassionate release requests were received, 31,000 of them, only 36 were allowed. Meanwhile, the pandemic has been devastating in our Bureau of Prison facilities. 265 inmates have died, including six within the last few weeks. The death of a 42-year-old man in August came after the Department of Justice denied his compassionate release request. Republicans and Democrats worked together to pass the First Step Act to make our justice system fairer and our community safer. These reforms are only as good as their implementation. Attorney General Garland, as you come before this committee, the right to vote and to have the votes of every American counted is under attack like no time in decades. This year alone, state legislators have introduced more than 425 bills, making it more difficult for Americans to vote, particularly people of color. 19 states have enacted 33 of these laws. Some of these laws set new limits on voting by mail. Others cut hours for polling locations. All of them, all of them are designed to achieve the same outcome, make it more difficult to vote. At the same time, big light proponents are pushing new laws to give partisan state legislators the ability to overturn election results they don't agree with. They are ousting local election officials who faithfully apply the law and oversaw an election that Trump's own Department of Homeland Security called the most secure in American history. And their efforts coincide with an unprecedented increase in violent threats toward state and local election officials. I'd like to add at this point about these violent threats. It is rife across America. Those of us who are airline passengers know what the flight attendants are facing with thousands of confrontations, even violent confrontations, over wearing masks on aircraft. I've sent a letter to you, joined by others, saying this has to be taken seriously. These assaults in the name, so-called name of liberty are unacceptable. And your October 4th memo relative to schools and school board officials in their own peril at this point, I think should be mentioned. I have heard statements from members of this committee which I think are really inconsistent with reality. Those who think the insurrectionist mob of January 6th was merely a group of tourists visiting the Capitol ignore the pillaging, the deaths, and the serious injuries to over 100 law enforcement officials. And those who argue that school board meetings across America are not more dangerous and more violent than in the past are ignoring reality. I went on and just typed in this morning school board violence on one of the search engines. Page after page is coming up. In my state of Illinois, Minden, Illinois, is a small rural town in Adams County, the western part of our state that I have represented for almost 40 years. It is a quiet, solid community, and yet they had their own instance at a school board meeting where an individual had to be arrested because he had threatened violence against the school board members over masks in schools, for example. That story is repeated over and over again. The state of Minnesota, Senator Klobuchar knows the story well. The state of Idaho. We are seeing violence at these school board meetings in an unprecedented number. I don't believe, I think you made it clear, that, and you don't believe, that we should infringe on free speech. But free speech does not involve threats and violence, period. And we ought to join with local law enforcement officials to protect the school board members who are being intimidated in this way. I want to close by mentioning an issue I said to you personally. I'm honored to represent the city which you grew up in and which I uh, now visit with great frequency, obviously, and that's the city of Chicago. The gun violence situation there is intolerable. Intolerable. And we're not the only city in America by any means that's facing this. We need to have your assurance that there is a concerted, determined effort to deal with gun violence at the federal level, coordinating our effort with the state and local officials. With that in mind, I hope we can reach some agreement to do so very quickly. And let me hand it off now to the ranking member, Senator Grassley. 
Thank you, Chairman Durbin. This committee has a constitutional obligation to ensure that the department complies with the laws that we write and execute those laws according to our intent. In the performance of our constitutional duty, we write letters seeking answers and records from the department and its component agencies to ben better understand what they're doing. Likewise, the entire executive branch, not just DOJ, has an obligation to respond to congressional oversight requests. Today, I can say with confidence that under General Garland's leadership, the department has failed across the board to comply with this committee's Republican oversight request. And I appreciate very much uh, Chairman Durbin pointing out a letter that he and I wrote five months haven't received an answer. If my name being on that letter has any reason it hasn't been responded to, I'll take my name off of that letter. In contrast, Governor or General Garland, you've provided Democrat colleagues with thousands of pages of materials. Moreover, President Biden has politicized and inserted himself into the department policymaking, notably, direct, notably directing the end of compulsory process for reporter records in criminal leak investigations, and most recently uh, in, inserting himself when he said the department should prosecute anyone who defies compulsory process from the January 6th committee. At your confirmation hearing, I read to you what I told Senator Sessions at his confirmation hearing for being Attorney General this, quote, if S Senator Feinstein, who then was a ranking member, if Senator Feinstein contacts you, do not use this excuse, as so many people use, that if you are not a chair of a committee, you do not have to answer the questions. I want her questions answered just like you would answer my questions, end of quote that I gave to Senator Sessions. So you said to me at your hearing, quote, I will not use any excuse to not answer your questions, Senator, end of quote. You have failed to satisfy that statement. Example, I've asked the Department for records relating to Hunter Biden's October 2018 firearm incident where his gun ended up in a trash can near a school. Now that's a firearm incident. Your ATF used the Federal Freedom of Information Act to refuse producing those records when that law doesn't even apply to the Congress. I've also asked for information relating to Chinese nationals linked to the communist Chinese regime that are connected to the Biden family. One individual, Patrick Ho, was not just linked to Chinese regime, he was apparently connected to that country's intelligence service. Hunter Biden reportedly represented him for $1 million. Now, even though the department already made public in court filings that DOJ possesses FISA information relating to Patrick Ho, in response, you stated, quote, unfortunately, under the circumstances described in your letter, we are not in a position to confirm the existence of the information that is sought if it exists in the department's possession. Well, let me emphasize, well, you already made it public in a court filing, so you're telling me you can't even confirm its existence. Now, with respect to the criminal investigation of Hunter Biden, Senator Johnson and I wrote to you twice this year regarding a person named Nicholas McQuaid. Mr. McQuaid was employed at a law firm until January 20th, 2021, when he was hired to be then acting Assistant Attorney General for the department's criminal division. Before he was hired, he worked with Christopher Clark, who Hunter Biden reportedly hired to work on his federal criminal case 
a month before President Biden's inauguration. Now, the department hasn't disputed any of these facts. However, you refuse to confirm whether Mr. McQuaid recused from the Hunter Biden case. That seems to be a pretty simple thing to say one way or the other. The son of the President of the United States is under criminal investigation for financial matters. A senior attorney under your command has apparent conflicts with that matter. Your refusal to answer just threshold questions casts a very public cloud over the entire investigation, a cloud that you should easily do away with if you just were just a little bit transparent. When I placed holds on your nominees for the department's failure to comply with Republican oversight requests, I said either you run the Department of Justice or the department runs you. Right now, it looks like the Department of Justice is running you. Since your confirmation in less than a year, the department has moved as far left as it can go. You've politicized the department in ways it shouldn't be. Case in point, your infamous school board member. Uh, you publicly issued this memo merely five days after the National School Board Association wrote a letter to President Biden. Now, incredibly, they asked the department to use the Anti-Terrorist Patriot Act against parents speaking their minds uh, to local school officials. The School Board Association has since apologized for that letter, but not before the department relied on their letter to mobilize federal law enforcement in state and local matters. Meanwhile, actual violent crime is on the rise in the country. Your memo treats parents speaking freely to be worthy of the department's heavy investigative and prosecutorial uh, hand. You've created a task force, now a task force, that includes the department's criminal division and National Security Division to potentially weaponize against parents. Your memo also creates a special training and guidance for local school boards and school administrators to recognize threats against them. According to your memo, these threats including, include an undefined category of quote unquote other forms of intimidation and harassment. So now, the last thing the Justice Department and FBI need is a very vague memo to unleash their power, especially when they've shown zero interest in holding their own accountable. I don't, uh, when you don't hold your own accountable, let's not forget about Ob Obama Biden administration FISA abuse during crossfire hurricane. Abuses that the department, the FBI, for years denied even to be possible. And then you allowed a disgraced former FBI official off the hook, paying him hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxpayers' money. When the inspector general determined that he lied to investigators seven times. Yes, seven times over the course of three different in occasions. Or the FBI's and the department's total failure to protect hundreds of kids from abuse by Larry Nassar and then cover it up when we had a bipartisan hearing to learn about those courageous survivors. Your deputy attorney general didn't even show up. So getting back to the National School Board Association matter, these parents are trying to protect their children. They're worried about divisive and harmful curricula based upon critical race theory. They're speaking their minds about mass mandates. This is the very core of constitutionally protected speech, and free speech is deadly to the tyranny of government and is the lifeblood of our constitutional republic to say your policies are outside of the mainstream 
would be an understatement. Mothers and fathers have a vested interest in how schools educate their children. They are not, as the Biden Justice Department apparently believes them to be, national security threats. What is a national security threat is things like MS-13. What is a national security threat is like our open southern borders. What is a national security threat is the federal government's failing to adequately vet individuals from Afghanistan. I suggest that you quickly change your course because you're losing credibility with the American people and with this senator in particular. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Grassley. We now turn to the Attorney General for his testimony. First, welcome Honorable Merrick Garland to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, for the information of the members, the mechanics are, are such. After I swear in Attorney General Garland, he will make his opening statement. Then we'll go to a round of questions. Each senator will have seven minutes. I'm going to try to hold folks close to that number so everybody can be accommodated. Uh, if there is a request, we may have a second round of questions uh, of three minutes per senator. Attorney General Garland, would you please stand to be sworn in? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Let the record reflect that the Attorney General answered in the affirmative. Now please proceed with your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and distinguished members of this committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. In my address to all Justice Department employees on my first day in office, I spoke about three co-equal priorities that should guide the Department's work. Upholding the rule of law, keeping our country safe, and protecting civil rights. The first core priority, upholding the rule of law, is rooted in the recognition that to succeed and retain the trust of the American people, the Justice Department must adhere to the norms that have been part of its DNA since Edward Levy's tenure as the first post-Watergate Attorney General. Those norms of independence from improper influence, of the principled exercise of discretion, and of treating like cases alike are what define who we are as public servants. Over the last seven months that I have served as Attorney General, the Department has reaffirmed and, where appropriate, updated and strengthened its policies that are foundational for these norms. For example, we strengthened our policy governing communications between the Justice Department and the White House. That policy is designed to protect the Department's criminal and civil law enforcement decisions and its legal judgments from partisan or other inappropriate influences. We also issued a new policy to better protect the freedom and independence of the press by restricting the use of compulsory process to obtain information from or records of members of the news media. The second core priority is keeping our country safe from all threats, foreign and domestic, while also protecting our civil liberties. We are strengthening our 200 joint terrorism task forces, the essential hubs for international and domestic counterterrorism cooperation across all levels of government nationwide. For FY22, we are seeking more than $1.5 billion, a 12% increase, for our counterterrorism work. We are also taking aggressive steps to counter cyber threats, whether from nation states, terrorists, or common criminals. In April, we launched both a comprehensive cyber review and a ransomware and digital extortion task force. In June, we seized a $2.3 million ransom payment made in Bitcoin to the group that targeted Colonial Pipeline. Keeping our country safe also requires reducing violent crime and gun violence. In May, we announced a comprehensive violent crime strategy which deploys all of our relevant departmental components to those ends. We also launched five cross-jurisdictional strike forces to disrupt illegal gun trafficking in key corridors across the country. And to support local police departments and help them build trust with the communities they serve, our FY22 budget requests over $1 billion for grants. 
We are likewise committed to keeping our country safe from violent drug trafficking networks that are, among other things, fueling the opioid overdose epidemic. Opioids, including illicit fentanyl, caused nearly 70,000 fatal overdoses in 2020. We will continue to use all of our resources to save lives. Finally, keeping our country safe requires protecting its democratic institutions, including the one we sit in today, from violent attack. As this committee is well aware, the department is currently engaged in one of the most sweeping investigations in its history in connection with the January 6th attack on the Capitol. The department's third priority is protecting civil rights. This was a founding purpose when the department was established in 1870. Today, the Civil Rights Division's work remains vital to safeguarding voting rights, prosecuting hate crimes, ensuring constitutional policing, and stopping unlawful discrimination. This year, we doubled the size of the Civil Rights Division's voting section, and our FY22 budget seeks the largest ever increase for the division, totaling more than 15 percent. We have appointed department-wide coordinators for our hate crimes work. We have stepped up our support for the Community Relations Service. We are also revitalizing and expanding our work to ensure equal access to justice. In addition to these core priorities, another important area of department focus is ensuring economic opportunity and fairness by reinvigorating antitrust enforcement, combating fraud, and protecting consumers. We are aggressively enforcing the antitrust laws by challenging anti-competitive mergers and exclusionary practices. In FY22, we are seeking a substantial increase in funds for the division. We likewise set up a COVID-19 fraud enforcement task force to bring to justice those who defraud the government of federal dollars meant for the most vulnerable among us. In sum, in seven months, the Justice Department has accomplished a lot of important work for the American people, and there is much more to be done. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, hardly a day goes by in the city of Chicago that someone isn't killed with a firearm. The cases are heartbreaking. Little boys and girls coming, standing on their porches and going to school. And on August 7th, the Chicago police officer Ella French and her partner, Officer Carlos Chanez, were conducting a routine traffic stop in the city. The person in the car opened fire. Officer French, age 29, was murdered, and Officer Yanez was severely wounded. I never saw such an outpouring of emotions in the city. I went down to Rita High School on the south side near Beverly, where they had the memorial service. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of women and men in uniform and just ordinary citizens standing, waiting for their turn to pay tribute to Ella French for what she had done for our city. Two days later, we found out from the U.S. Attorney's Office that the gun used to murder her was obtained from Indiana through a straw purchase. That's when a person who can, who can clear a background check buys a gun at a federal licensed gun dealer and gives it to someone who cannot clear it. What are we going to do about this? What is going to be done at the federal level to show that we're taking this seriously? Ours isn't the only city that is facing this challenge, and we've got to act and act soon. Mr. Chairman, I am as concerned as you are and as I'm sure all members of this committee are about the rise of violent crime all across the country. I was in Chicago, as you know, at almost the exact time that the officer that you speak of was killed. I have gone to meet with the families of an ATF agent who was killed on duty, and I have stood on the mall for the candlelight vigil for many other police officers who were killed in the line of duty. The Justice Department is doing everything possible with respect to violent crime. In May of this year, I launched a violent crime initiative, which brings together all of our law enforcement on the federal level to meet with, to coordinate with, to cooperate with state, local, tribal, territorial law enforcement to, f to fight this issue. Our federal agencies, DEA, ATF, Marshals, and the FBI are all deeply involved in this. Our programs, Project Safe Neighborhoods, continue 
in all these ways, and we're looking for a lot, large amounts of money to provide in grants to police departments. Specifically, with respect to the gun trafficking that you're speaking about, uh, as you know, Chicago is one of the uh, task force cities that we've uh, announced for purposes of tracing this gun trafficking problem, uh, and we are doing so and finding the straw purchasers and arresting them as well. I could not um, agree more that this is a serious, serious problem that needs the attention of the entire country's law enforcement and the Justice Department is very much involved in the fight. I'm going to be uh, meeting with those federal law enforcement agencies to talk about the strike force and what they're doing, how they're cooperating with state and local uh, law enforcement. Uh, I hope to do it maybe even this week on a private basis and then to see what more I can do. I think we all have a responsibility when it comes to this issue. Let me ask you about the home uh, confinement issue. Uh, we all know under the CARES Act there was an allowance for that possibility, and we know that since March of last year, more than 33,000 inmates have been released to home con confinement, including those released under the CARES Act expanded authority. Less than 1% of those inmates have been returned to BOP facilities for any rules violation. Do you re agree that recalling the thousands of individuals who have successfully transitioned back into society would be contrary to the purpose of home confinement, which is to allow an individual, quote, a reasonable opportunity to adjust to and prepare for reentry of that prisoner in the community? Senator, I very much agree that the home confinement program has proven successful, that it both relieved the pressure on the prisons with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but also gave people an opportunity to adjust themselves to their communities. And you are right that we have seen very few violations of the conditions. Uh, so I'm very strongly in favor of being able to continue this program. Well, I'm hoping that um, we can get a definitive reversal of the OLC opinion that was dropped on the desk as President Trump left office and make it very clear what will happen if and when, and I pray that soon, the COVID-19 emergency is lifted. I'd like to move to another topic which has already been addressed by myself and Senator Grassley. I really invite the members of this committee, if you don't believe me, type school board violence into your computer and take a look at what's happening. It's happening all across the country. In my state, as I mentioned, a 30-year-old man arrested and charged with battery, disorderly conduct after striking a school board member at a meeting. California, father yelling profanities at an elementary school principal. His daughter calmed him down. He later returned to confront the principal and struck a teacher in the face who attempted to intervene. Ohio, a school board member sent a threatening letter saying, we're coming after you. And after the board member posted a letter on Facebook, the president of the Board of Education for a nearby district reported his board had received similar threats. Pennsylvania, a person posted threats on social media which required the police to station outside each of that district school. Local law enforcement is investigating the person who made the threats and will maintain a police presence at schools and school board meetings for the foreseeable future. In Texas, a parent physically assaulting a teacher, ripping off her mask, and it goes on and on and on. These are not routine people incensed or angry. These are people who are acting out their feelings in a violent manner over and over again. The same people we see on airplanes and other places, the same people, some of whom we saw here on January 6th. So when you responded as quickly as you did to that school board request, did you have second thoughts after they sent a follow-up letter saying they didn't agree with their original premise in their first letter? Senator, I think all of us have seen these reports of violence and threats of violence. That is what the Justice Department is concerned about. It's not only in the context of violence and threats of violence against school board members, school personnel, teachers, staff. It's in a, in a rising tide of threats of violence against judges, against prosecutors, uh, against secretaries of state, against election administrators, against doctors, against protesters, against news reporters. That's the reason that we responded as quickly as we did when we got a, a, a letter indicating that there were uh, threats of violence and violence with respect to school officials and school staff. Um, that's the reason. That's what we are concerned about. That's part of our core responsibility. The letter that, we, um, that was subsequently sent does not change 
uh, um, association's concern about violence or threats of violence. Uh, it, it alters some of the language in the letter, language in, in the letter that we did not rely on and is not contained in my own memorandum. The only thing the Justice Department is concerned about is violence and threats of violence. Senator Grassley? Yeah. Before I ask my question, I'd like to permission to introduce in the hearing record a letter from the Iowa Association of School Boards uh, disagreeing with the National School Boards Association request for intervention from federal agencies and law enforcement and uh, other concerns that they have. Without objection. Yeah. Uh, General Garland, regarding your October 4th school board memo, last week you said the memo was for law enforcement audience despite it being on your public website as a press release. As a result of your memo, local school officials and parents may not speak up in these meetings out of fear that the federal government will do something to them. So that's a poisonous chilling effect. Apparently that letter wasn't actually supported by organization, but was sent by two unauthorized staff. So last week the organization disavowed it, since you and the White House based your memo on this delegitimized letter. I assume you're going to revoke your extremely divisive memo that you said was instigated because of that letter. That's a question. Senator, the memo, which is referred to as one page, it responds to concerns about violence, threats of violence, other criminal conduct. That's all it's about. And all it asks is for federal law enforcement to consult with, meet with local law enforcement to assess the circumstances, to strategize about what may or may not be necessary, to provide federal assistance if it is necessary. Presumably. You wrote the memo because of the letter. The letter is disavowed now. So you're going to keep your memo going anyway, right? Is that what you're telling me? Senator, I have the letter from NSBA that you're referring to. It apologizes for language in the letter, but it continues its concern about the safety of school officials and school staff. The language in the letter that they disavow is language was never included in my memo and never would have been. I did not adopt every concern that they had in their letter. I adopted only the concern about violence and threats of violence, and that hasn't changed. Who in the Justice Department was responsible for drafting your polarizing October 4th memo? I signed the memo, and I worked on the memo. The, the memo press release accompanying your memo mentions that the National Security Division will get involved in school board investigations. Is the Justice Department National Security Division really necessary for keeping local school boards safe if parents aren't domestic terrorists and if the Patriot Act isn't being used? Why is the National Security uh, Division involved at all? This kind of looks like something that would come out of some communist country uh, expansive definition of national security. The memo is only about violence and threats of violence. It makes absolutely clear in the, in the first paragraph, the spirited debate about policy matters is protected under our Constitution. That includes debate by parents criticizing school bo boards. That is welcome. The Justice Department protects that kind of debate. The only thing we're concerned about, Senator, is violence and threats of violence against school officials, school teachers, school staff. Just like we're concerned about those kind of threats against senators, members of Congress, uh, election officials. In all of those circumstances, we are trying to prevent the violence that sometimes occurs after threats. Your memo stated that the Justice Department is opening dedicated lines of communication for threat reporting, assessment, and response. Why is the department, what is the department doing with tips it receives on this dedicated line, and what are you doing with those parents who have been reported? The, uh, uh, the FBI gets complaints, concerns from people around the country for all different kinds of threats and violence. That's what this is about, a place where people who feel that they've been threatened 
with violence can report that. These are then assessed, and they are only pursued if consistent with the First Amendment we have a true threat that violates federal statutes or that needs to be referred to a state or local government, uh, federal agency, uh, local uh, law enforcement agency for their assistance. On the other hand, are there criminal investigations being opened for instances where school officials are trying to assess private data of parents with the opposing views on critical race theory? Um, I don't know about that, but uh, uh, it, it, the Justice Department certainly does not believe that anybody's uh, personal information should be accessed in that way. Um, if there's a federal offense involved or a state or local offense involved, then, of course, those should be reported. The nonpartisan Justice Department Inspector General established that Andrew McCabe lied under oath to FBI investigators. He lied under oath to the Justice Department Inspector General. It should also be noted that McCain leaked government information to the media and then called the New York and Washington FBI field offices and blamed them for the very leaks that he caused. Under your leadership, instead of punishing him, the department reinstated his retirement, expunged his records as part of the settlement. He will reportedly receive $200,000 in retirement back pay, and his attorney will reportedly receive $500,000 in legal fees. So it seems to me that that's beyond incredible. So, General Garland, did you authorize the McCain settlement? And if you, if not, who did? Senator, the McCabe uh, settlement uh, was the recommendation of the career lawyers litigating that case based on their prospects of success in the case. The case did not involve the, the issues about uh, lying. It involved a claim that he was not given amount of time necessary to respond uh, to, to um, uh, allegations. Um, and uh, the, the litigators concluded that they needed to settle the case because of the likelihood of loss on the merits of that claim. The Inspector General's report still stands. Uh, there is no, we have not questioned in any way the Inspector General's findings. Uh, the reference with respect to uh, false statements was made uh, to the Justice Department in the previous administration and declined in the previous administration. The only issue here was an assessment of litigation merits. Short follow-up. Do you agree with the taxpayer, since you didn't, somebody else authorized it, do you agree with the taxpayer picking up a multi-million dollar bill for someone that lied under oath to government officials? I think the assessment made by the litigators was that the bill to the taxpayers would be higher if we didn't resolve the matter as it was resolved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Leahy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Attorney General Garland, good to see you, and thank you for being here. I'm sure the uh, members of the committee are eager to discuss with you what the Justice Department is doing, what could be done better. Um, I'll just say this. After four tumultuous years in which the former president viewed the Justice Department as his personal law firm, I'm <clears throat> pleased the Department is again living up to the most fundamental principle in our American justice system, that no one, nobody, is above the law. That's really what <clears throat> I learned about the Justice Department when I was in law school, that the experience I'd had with it for years as a prosecutor and as a litigator. So I was dismayed seeing what was happening in the past four years, and I thank you, Attorney General, for bringing the department back from the brink. Uh, there's still a lot to be done, but I think the Americans should take comfort that the rule of law is again being enforced. Now, it's hard to overstate how urgently we must act to protect Americans' constitutional right to vote. And there is reason for alarm. Many states are rapidly moving to restrict access to the ballot for tens of thousands of Americans from all walks of life. In the wake of the Shelby County and this year's Brnovich decision, <clears throat> the department's tools to stem this tide of voter suppression, voter suppression have been greatly diminished. I know you're doing whatever you can to defend the right to vote. 
How does congressional inaction in response to these Supreme Court decisions limit the ability of the Department to protect Americans' constitutional right to vote? Thank you for that question, Senator. The um, right to vote is central pillar of our democracy, and as I've said many times, it's the central pillar that allows all other rights uh, to proceed from it. The Justice Department was established in part to protect the rights of, uh, of, uh, guaranteed under the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to vote. The Voting Rights Act gave us further authorities in that respect. We are doing, as you say, everything we can. We have doubled the size of the voting rights section. We brought a Section 2 case. But there are limitations on our authority that the Supreme Court has imposed, one of which is the elimination of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which provided an opportunity to do preclearance reviews so that we did not have to review each matter on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, and then the recent, and that was Shelby County, as you pointed out, and the recently in the Brnovich case, a narrowing of what we regarded as the meaning of Section 2 and our authorities under Section 2. Both of those could be fixed by this Congress, and if they were, it would give us considerably greater opportunity and ability to ensure the sacred right to vote. And didn't the Supreme Court make it very clear that we could fix that if the, if the Congress wanted to? That, that's correct. In the opinions, they indicated these were uh, matters that could be fixed by the Congress. And I hope we will, because I think it's very important that all Americans be protected in their right to vote. We'd, I know in my own state of Vermont, we take that very seriously. Uh, now, we have the bipartisan uh, VOCA fix to sustain the Crime Victims Fund Act of 2021. It's been signed into law. Uh, a major piece of this legislation requires funds collected under deferred and non-prosecution agreements be deposited into the crime Victims Fund, which had been projected to reach a 10-year low. Since this bill has become law, have any funds from deferred or non-prosecution agreements been deposited in, into the Crime Victims Fund? And if not, why not? Senator, the VOCA fix was something we sought, and we're grateful for your support for and for your introduction of. We acted immediately after um, it was passed, and something like uh, uh, north of $200 million has already been deposited in the fund uh, thanks to that act. We now project uh, that the fund should be um, um, uh, liquid all the way through the end of uh, 2022. Thank you, and we can um, review it after that because I think you and I would both agree we want to have long-term sustainability in this fund. Absolutely. So let's work together on that. Now, there's been some discussion here and elsewhere about the uh, Larry Nasser investigation. And the chairman had these very impressive gymnasts who testified before us. It was heart-wrenching listening to them. and. We, they talked about how they were seeking accountability, and I, I could not help but think how brave they were to testify. Now, the Justice Department initially declined to bring charges against the disgraced FBI agents involved in the investigation. I was concerned, and I, I said at the time, that I've seen many people prosecuted for lying to uh, FBI agents. Here you had two FBI agents who lied to FBI agents. Uh, one was fired, the other resigned. No prosecutions. Is the department now reviewing that decision not to prosecute? And do you have any update with regard to that review? Senator, I think heart-wrenching is, is uh, not even strong enough as a description of what happened uh, to those uh, gymnasts. Uh, and to the testimony they gave. I, b I believe Deputy Attorney General of Monaco uh, said at her hearing um, that we are reviewing this matter. 
Um, new evidence has come to light, uh, and that has caused uh, for a uh, uh, review of the, of the matters that you're discussing. Well, I hope, I hope you will, because as I said, I've seen so many prosecutions of somebody for lying to an FBI agent, and I understand that. But when an FBI agent lies to an FBI agent, they should also face the same uh, that anybody else does. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Leahy. Mr. Chairman, could I put something in the record from 17 state attorney generals expressing their disagreement with the department's October 4th memorandum and ask that it, that, that memorandum be withdrawn? Without objection. Senator Graham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, are you aware of the caravan of about 3,000 people approaching the state of Texas? I have read about it in the news media, yes. <clears throat> I, I didn't know. I think it's south of Mexico City uh, is what I read. Yeah, they're what you're talking apparently about. headed toward Texas. So what would you tell these people? Well, um, the, I would tell them not to come, but okay. the uh, job of the Justice Department um, uh, has to do uh, uh, with um, uh, prosecution and with uh, um, 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 the, use, the way in which the uh, asylum and uh, uh, removal claims are adjudicated. All right. Principal so you would tell them not to come? The, it depends on why they are coming. Well, if they're coming to make asylum claims, what would you tell them? Well, um, like the Department of Homeland Security is the agency yeah. that's responsible for border control. Right. right. I, I get that. But you're the Attorney General of the United States. Do you yeah. think our asylum laws are being abused? The asylum laws are statutes passed by the Congress. Yeah. Do you think they're being abused? I, I think this is a, 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 that question is one that has to be evaluated on a one-by-one one basis in each. Uh, Have you talked to the board? When's the last time you've been to the border? I think a week ago, maybe 10 days ago. Did they tell you anything about asylum claims being made by people that are mostly economic claims, not, not asylum claims? Did they mention that to you? I think it's fair. I don't recall exactly. I think it's fair. You don't recall being told by the Border Patrol that they're overwhelmed, they can't hold the line much anymore, that we've had 1.7 million people apprehended, and the big magnet, the pull factor, is the way the catch and release program around asylum, that didn't stick out to you? That was not a discussion that I had when I was Who did you border. talk to? I was at the border at Nogales and spoke to border protection. Yeah, I was there about six months ago. They never mentioned to you the pull factors of illegal immigration? This was a, a review of what they were doing at the border with respect to... Well, well, it's a simple question. They never mentioned to you that they've got a problem with being overrun by asylum seekers. I know from reading the news media that, met, that Border Patrol agents feel that way. So, well, I mean, it's not about reading the paper. You were there talking to them. Well, I don't recall that. I don't want to, to re, re, okay. tell you about a conversation that I'm not yeah, sure I, I'm happened. just stunned that, that, didn't, that you can't recall that. Uh, so let's talk about Afghanistan. The secretary, undersecretary, for defense policy, uh, Mr. Kale said, while ISIS-K poses more of a short-term external threat, Al-Qaeda could regain the ability to launch attacks outside of Afghanistan within a year or two. Do you agree with that? I, I, I agree that Al-Qaeda has always presented and continues to present a persistent threat to the United States homeland. Well, no, we but the question is, What's changed? You say always. Has any recent event changed the likelihood of an attack? I don't know. Um, you don't know that we withdrew from Afghanistan? I know we withdrew. I don't know whether the withdrawal will increase the risk from al-Qaeda or not. So you're the I Attorney General of the United States. Secretary Ray testified openly twice that due to the lack of ability to have eyes and ears on the ground, and the <clears throat> unreliability of the Taliban that a attack on the United States within six months a year is far more likely after our withdrawal. You're not aware that he said that? The job of the 
Justice Department and the job of the FBI is to protect against those kind of attacks in the homeland. Does it make sense that that would be a dynamic of our withdrawal? Do you trust the Taliban to, to police al-Qaeda and ISIS on our behalf? I do not trust the Taliban. Matter of fact, they have openly told us they will not work with us regarding con containing the al-Qaeda uh, ISIS. Are you aware of that? I think there has been inconsistency. Associated forces are and continue to be. We're talking about the Taliban. The Taliban has told the United States they will not work with our counterterrorism forces when it comes to Al Qaeda or ISIS. What response should we have regarding the Taliban when they say that? Well, I think we have a number of different uh, tools available. Like uh, what? We have economic sanctions. We, they need uh, uh, money from the United States for humanitarian and other reasons. But this is a... So the leverage over the Taliban is whether or not we'll give them money. Senator, the job of the Justice Department is protecting, uh, using the FBI and, uh, and the National Security Agency. The National Security Division is part of our counterterrorism operation, right? It is one. Has anybody from the National Security Division briefed you about the increased likelihood of attack emanating from Afghanistan after our withdrawal? Every day I'm briefed by the FBI. No, my question is specific. Has anybody briefed you about the increased likelihood of an attack emanating from Afghanistan by ISIS or Al Qaeda? because of our complete withdrawal. We are worried about the risk of attack by ISIS. I, I, I know, it's one thing to be worried. Has anybody told you the likelihood of an attack is greater because of our withdrawal there or not? Are different views about the degrees of likelihood that doesn't change our posture, which D is to all well, it, be it, protective. It doesn't change your posture if you go from a possibility of being attacked to a six months to a year time window of being attacked. We have asked for substantial additional funds for our counterterrorism operations in light Is of that in light of the withdrawal from Afghanistan? In light of a lot of changing circumstances uh, in the world with respect to Well, let to me just put question. a fine point on this. Uh, Secretary Ray has told the world that ISIS and Al Qaeda in Afghanistan present a threat to our homeland. The Taliban has told us they're not going to help us when it comes to policing these groups. Uh, the Department of Defense has said we're a six months to a year away from a possible attack by ISIS and Al Qaeda. And it just seems to me there's not a sense of urgency about this. There is a sense of urgency. This is what have you done specifically? Every, now, I'll every end with night. this. Specifically, what have you done? since our withdrawal in Afghanistan to deal with this new, new threat? We have strengthened and increased the efforts of our joint terrorism task forces. I have met with them. Literally, what have you done? I'm telling Just put you. it in writing. Just write down well, what you've done. I'll, I'll be happy to, to okay. have our staff uh, assess what Thank they you. told you in, in return. Thank you, Senator Graham. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome, Attorney General Garland. Um, two topics. Uh, the first is um, executive privilege. Uh, we've been through a rather um, bleak period with regard to executive privilege. I think you could call it the anything goes pr uh, period in which any assertion of executive privilege, no matter how fanciful or preposterous, was essentially allowed to stand in very significant departure from the law that has been out there for years regarding executive privilege. And at the same time that the substance of executive privilege was being um, expanded beyond recognition, um, the procedure for evaluating executive procedure determinations was completely ignored. And this is a procedure that was established by President Reagan's White House. So we now have a situation in which there is very substantial destruction 
and disarray in the area of executive privilege determinations. And um, as you know, under the Reagan memo, the Department of Justice had a role, kind of as an arbiter, to be the honest broker between whatever executive agency was objecting and whatever congressional committee was pursuing information. Um, that role completely fell apart in the last administration, um, and it needs to be rebuilt in some predictable fashion. The role of the courts has become highly problematic um, because delay is very often dispositive in these matters, and the courts are now a haven for delay with respect to executive privilege determinations. So I think we need to look at that as well. Uh, Senator Kennedy and I had a hearing on this executive privilege problem in our court subcommittee. Uh, the Department of Justice was not represented at that hearing, but I would like to ask you to detail somebody from the Department of Justice to talk to Senator Kennedy and me about this executive privilege problem and work with us on trying to figure out a solution making the role of the Department of Justice more clear and transparent and perhaps embodying it in rule or regulation or law and trying to figure out how to accelerate at the courts a way to get quicker decisions because otherwise, as I said, delay is just dispositive and we lose not because we're wrong but because we're delayed. Would you have somebody be our point of contact on that, please? When I say detail, I don't mean onto our payroll. You know, I just mean as a point of contact. Yes, absolutely, of course. Great. Thank you. Next. I've been pursuing the question of the department's investigation into January 6th since pretty early days, starting with a letter in January 8th that asked about the resources that were being deployed into this investigation and whether a task force, uh, prosecution task force was being set up and so forth. And then uh, another letter February 24th with, regarding to, uh, with regard to uh, domestic uh, extremist violence groups, potential role. We've learned a little bit more now, and we've learned that there was a lot of money sloshing around in the background behind the January 6th rally and behind the raid, the riot in the Capitol. For instance, we know that the Bradley Foundation, which is a big funder, um, gave money to Turning Point USA and to Public Interest Legal Foundation um, and it gets even more interesting because Turning Point USA has a twin called Turning Point Action, 501c3, 501c4 combo, which also got money from the Judicial Crisis Network to support the so-called Italy Gate, the debunked Italy Gate theory. At the same time, the Public Interest Legal Foundation had as its director Mr. Eastman, who was cranking out his fanciful memo for President Trump how to overturn the election. Um, the Judicial Crisis Network is the same thing from a corporate standpoint as something called the Honest Elections Project, which was bringing a, a fanciful case in Pennsylvania regarding election fraud. And the Judicial Crisis Network was also funding RAGA, the, Rhode Island, the Republican Attorney General's Association, which was making robocalls to get people to come to the riot. Now, I don't know what's going on behind all of that, but I am hoping that the due diligence of the FBI is being deployed not just to the characters who trespassed in the Capitol that day and who engaged in violent acts, but that you're taking the look you would properly take at any case involving players behind the scenes, funders of the enterprise, and so forth in this matter as well. And there's been no decision to say we're limiting this case just to the people in the building that day. We're not going to take a serious look at anybody behind it. Senator, I'm very limited as to what I can say. I understand that. We have a criminal investigation going forward. Please tell me it has not been constrained only to people in the yes. Capitol. Uh, the, uh, the investigation is being conducted by the prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Office and by the FBI field office. We have not constrained them in any way. Great. And the old doctrine of follow the money, which is a well-established principle of prosecution is it's fair, uh, it's fair to alive say, and well. 
it's fair to say that all investigative techniques of which you're familiar uh, and some maybe that you're not uh, familiar with because they post-date your time are all being uh, pursued in this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Senator Cornyn. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Attorney General. On um, September the 29th, 2021, as you know, the National School Board Association wrote a letter to the President asking him to address uh, the disruptions, the um, confrontations that we've seen at local school boards across the, uh, across the country, parents expressing their concerns about not only the curriculum, but also just generally their, the education of their children in uh, public schools. Would you agree that parents have a fundamental right to be uh, involved in their, in their children's education? Absolutely. This is the job of parents to be involved, and this is the role of the First Amendment to protect their ability to be involved. And that's why my memo begins by saying that we respect the right to a spirited debate about curriculum, about school policies, about anything like that. So it's not just, it's not just a good idea. It's actually protected by the Constitution of the United States. Would you agree? Absolutely. On October the 4th, a few days uh, later, less than a week later, after the National School Board Association wrote this letter, uh, the Justice Department issued the memo that's already been discussed. Um, why did this uh, rise to the level of a federal concern as opposed to being addressed at the local and state level? So th this arises out of uh, uh, repeated reports of violence and threats of violence, not only with respect to school boards and school officials and teachers, but as I, uh, I mentioned earlier, also with respect to secretaries of state and um, election administrators, judges, prosecutors, senators, members of Congress. The Justice Department has two roles here. We assist uh, state and local law enforcement uh, in all ways uh, and we enforce federal laws uh, which prohibit threats uh, of violence um, um, uh, in, um, uh, by telephone, by email. Well, well you as a longtime federal judge um, with a distinguished legal career, you understand that not every crime, assuming it is a crime, is a federal crime, correct? Absolutely. And some of these things... Um, uh, unless there's some nexus to interstate commerce or to the federal government, uh, it's, they're largely within the purview of the state and local law enforcement authorities, correct? I think you put that correctly. We have uh, authority with respect to the mail, with respect to the Internet, with respect right. to the Right. Well, I'm phone. not – well, for, let me give you an example. If somebody says to the school board member, if you do that, I'm going to meet you outside and punch you in the nose, is that a federal offense? No, or that's, that's not a federal offense. And, I agree. Uh, there's nothing I agree. in this memo and, suggesting that it is. And why in the world would you cite the National Security Division in this memo as being um, one of the appropriate uh, entities of the Department of Justice to investigate and perhaps prosecute uh, these offenses? So my memo itself doesn't mention the National Security Division. It is mentioned in another memo that was released by the Department. The National Security Division, like all the other law enforcement components, cooperates with and is involved in discussions about how to go forward on different kinds of matters. They were involved, for example, in the election threats. Um, um, they were involved in the threats against uh, judges and prosecutors. They were involved in the hate crimes uh, threats cases. It's just well, a natural part of our internal um, uh, analysis. Let me ask you, or did you see the National School Board Association letter to President Biden before you issued your uh, memorandum on uh, October the 4th? Yeah, yes, I did, and you know, that was part of the reason, um, their, their expression at the beginning of that memorandum. of. Biden. And they raised, they raised some of the concerns that you've voiced here uh, today, correct? They raised some of them. They raised others that I don't agree with and were not included in my memo. Well, you're, you're aware that on October the 22nd, the uh, National School Board Association apologized uh, for its letter. You're aware of that, aren't you, sir? 
I am, but... And it said that, uh, went on to say, we regret and apologize for the letter. There was no justification for some of the language in the letter. They acknowledged that the voices of parents should be and must continue to be heard when it comes to decisions about their children's education, health, and safety. You did not apologize for your memorandum of October the 4th, even though the National School Board Association did. Why didn't you rescind that memorandum and apologize for, your, um, for the memorandum? The core responsibility of the Justice Department, as I said in my opening, is protecting Americans from violence and threats of violence. But you it, just said not every act of violence is a federal crime, correct? Right, right and not every bit of street crime and the kind of violence um, that we've been talking about earlier today is also a federal crime, but we assist state and locals to help them uh, in, in um, their investigations of these kind of matters. Every single day in non-federal matters, we are partners with our state and local um, um, partners. Well, Mr. Attorney General, you've acknowledged that parents have a right, a constitutional right, to be uh, heard on the education of their children in public schools. Can you imagine the sort of intimidation the sort of uh, bullying impact that a memorandum from the Department of Justice would have and how that would chill the willingness of parents to exercise their rights under threat of federal prosecution. Did you consider the chilling impact your memorandum would have on parents exercising their constitutional rights? The only thing this memorandum is about is violence and threats of violence, and it opens with a statement. But my question is, did you consider the chilling effect this would have on parents' constitutional rights? To say that the Justice Department is against violence and threats of violence. Did you consider the chilling effect your memorandum might have on parents exercising their constitutional rights? I think you can answer that yes or no. What I considered, which I wanted the memorandum to assure people that we uh, uh, recognize the rights of spirited debate. and Mr. Spirit. Attorney General, you're a very intelligent and accomplished lawyer mm. and judge. You can answer the question. Did, did you consider... I do not. The chilling effect that this sort of threat of federal prosecution would have on parents' exercise of their constitutional rights to be involved in their children's education. I don't believe it's reasonable to read this memorandum as chilling anyone's rights. It's about threats of violence, and it expressly recognizes the constitutional right to, to make arguments about your children's education. As senators are going back and forth for votes during this time, we have to try to keep to let the, the record reflect the attorney general refused to answer the question and let the let the uh, record reflect that the senator from texas was allowed to go over his allotted time senator klobuchar thank you very much um just to um, confirm something mr attorney general can you confirm to this committee as you did earlier before the house judiciary committee uh that the purpose of the memo that you were just discussing with senator cornyn uh is to have meetings to discuss whether there's a problem, to discuss strategies, to discuss whether law, local law enforcement needs assistance or doesn't need assistance. Was that the purpose of it? Yes. Uh, I thank you for making that point, Senator. That's, I say that in the memo, that the, the, that the purpose of the, meeting, of the memo is to convene meetings with federal, state, and local tribal leaders and to facilitate discussions of strategies for addressing threats, to assess the question, and to open lines of communication about such threats. Thank you. Uh, I want to move to uh, some other threats. Um, and that is a hearing that actually Senator Blunt and I had yesterday. It was a bipartisan hearing. We both called witnesses. It was before the Rules Committee. Um, and it was with both Republican and Democratic election officials. The Attorney General of Arizona, a Republican local official in Philadelphia. And they told stories that horrified uh, senators on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the uh, Philadelphia election official, commissioner, local election official, had been sent letters um, uh, basically saying that he, they were going to kill him and his three kids, naming the kids, um, as well as 
um, putting his house and his address out there. Uh, Katie Hobbs, the Attorney General of Arizona, uh, <clears throat> received a voicemail saying, I am a hunter and I think you should be hunted. You will never be safe in Arizona again. Um, could you talk about what's going on with threats against election workers? Um, and uh, by the way, we had uh, the Republican Secretary of State from Kentucky talked about the fact uh, that it has been difficult. They are losing um, in many jurisdictions across the country. They don't have enough election workers because people are afraid. And um, we don't have to discuss at length where these threats are coming from. I just want to have election officials. I want to have a functioning democracy. Um, can you provide an update on the Election Threats Task Force and um, um, see, talk about what the kind of threats we're seeing to election officials. Uh, y yes, Senator. Um, very much like the circumstances with respect to the school boards, when the National S uh, School Board Association wrote us a letter uh, advising of threats of violence and violence. Uh, earlier this year, we received uh, communications from the National Association of Secretaries of State and the National Association of um, Election Administrators um, uh, raising concerns about threats of violence and violence in, in that area. Um, in that, uh, there, soon thereafter, I met uh, virtually, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, with a large number of uh, election administrators and secretary of states, uh, where they recounted these, uh, uh, the kind of threats uh, that you're talking about. Um, and that led us to establish a task force, um, which again, uh, coordinated efforts between um, the federal law enforcement agencies, U.S. attorneys' offices, and state and local uh, law enforcement uh, across the country. Uh, it is the case that many of those kind of threats can be handled by state and local uh, law enforcement and should be where they're capable of doing that. But the federal government has an important role, as you say, in protecting our democracy and protecting its threats against public officials. So there are, that is an ongoing um, um, uh, task force um, evaluating uh, threats in that particular area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to another area, as chair of the Competition Policy and Antitrust Subcommittee, uh, I've urged the Justice Department to make antitrust enforcement a top priority. We uh, recently had a nominations hearing for um, Jonathan Cantor. That seems to be moving ahead. And I support the division's uh, enforcement efforts, including I know they're preparing for 18 trials, uh, which is the most in uh, decades. And uh, could you talk about the antitrust budget? Senator Grassley and I have passed a bill with the support of the members of this committee um, to add some additional resources to the antitrust division. Senator Lee and I have held numerous um, very informative hearings about various issues related to antitrust. Uh, could you talk about what's happening there? The uh, Justice Department is very much committed. As I said, it's a key focus of our attention. Um, and I trust enforcement because it's essential uh, for consumer uh, well-being and for the well-being of our citizens. Um, we have aggressively moved in this area. We've already stopped um, a merger of two of the top three largest uh, international insurance brokers. Uh, we have, as you say, uh, continued. Uh, uh, we, we are in the middle of uh, trials. Uh, criminal trials with respect to uh, uh, price fixing and market allocation. We have the ongoing uh, matter involving uh, exclusionary conduct in the Google case. Uh, we are looking, uh, we have investigations and uh, attention in many areas from healthcare to, uh, to agriculture. Uh, to uh, allocations within labor markets. Uh, could, could I just ask you, we were talking about the criminal cases, could giving the antitrust agencies authority to seek substantial civil fines uh, for Sherman Act violations help enforcers deter anti-competitive conduct? I'm sorry. I, I, A civil, would civil fines, would that be helpful? Uh, uh, yes, uh, having the ability to, to, to uh, seek civil fines as well uh, would be helpful. Of course, if we succeed in a criminal case, the follow-on civil cases become quite easy, mm -hmm. um, uh, as I know from my own uh, antitrust practice. But we are uh, down in the number of, um, of, of uh, attorneys in the antitrust division uh, considerably, and we need an expansion. That's why we've asked for a 9% uh, increase. Uh, total increase of 201 million um, in our FY22 budget. 
Okay. The number of mergers has uh, skyrocketed, and the number of people we have in the division evaluating uh, that those mergers has uh, decreased. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need help in that regard. Thank you, and I really appreciate the bipartisan work we've done in this committee on that front. Uh, last question, in July, the department announced that it was adopting a new policy that restricts the use of compulsory process to obtain information from members of the news media acting within the scope of news gathering activities, an issue we discussed, you and I discussed at your confirmation hearing. As a part of that announcement, you asked the Deputy Attorney General to undertake a review process to further explain, develop, and codify the policy. Can you provide an update on the steps the Deputy Attorney General has taken to ensure that the new policy is implemented? Yes, yeah, so um, uh, issuing a memo is good, and it controls the Justice Department now. Uh, the next step, though, is to have a regulation, which will um, uh, give us some greater permanence, and the next step after that would be legislation, which the uh, Justice Department supports on uh, what the Attorney Gen Deputy Attorney General not is doing now, is trying to formulate uh, the general outlines of my, my memorandum into a regulation, uh, which can uh, replace the current um, pretty detailed uh, regulations that we have. That's what she's involved in right now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mr. Attorney General, we had promised you a five-minute break at 11.30. We can either take it right now, or I can have Senator Lee and Coons ask. Up to you. I'm happy to go ahead with Senator Lee and Coons. Let's proceed. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Attorney General Garland, for being here. Mr. Attorney General, I've been concerned in recent weeks uh, by, by some steps that have been taken by the Biden administration, um, steps that I fear represent a significant amount of overreach. Um, you know, seven weeks ago, you had President Biden giving a speech in which he promised to enlist the assistance of corporate America, all of corporate America, with more than 99 employees uh, in firing people who, who don't get vaccinated. Now, I'm vaccinated. I've encouraged everyone close to me to get vaccinated, but I don't think it's the role of the federal government to do that. He's threatening to cripple employers by imposing absolutely punishing fines on them, and they're now doing his dirty, dirty work even before this act of overreach has been reduced to an order that could be litigated, uh, litigation that I believe would end the, say, the same way Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer ended. And um, now, you know, about a month after that, we have your October 4th memorandum in which you direct the Department of Justice and the FBI to intervene in what, as far as I can tell, is a, a, a state and, and local issue. That, that is, a series of issues involving how parents advocate for their children with their local school boards. I, and I, I also believe that doing that, and doing that through the Department of Justice, doing it in the way that you did it, directing the assistance, enlisting the help of all 94 U.S. attorneys, therefore every satellite office of the Department of Justice nationwide, you do it in a way that I think uh, has a natural tendency to chill free speech in this area. I, I question seriously the role of the federal government in protecting people at local school board meetings from their neighbors. It is, after all, most of the time, state law, not federal, that's at play. Uh, when, when there is criminal activity. Federal crimes are a, are a subset of crimes generally. So you, you've referenced several times today that your letter covered only violence and threats of violence, and yet the very opening line of your memo says, in recent months there's been a disturbing fight, uh, spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence against school administrators, school board members, teachers, and staff who participate in the vital work of running our nation's public schools. You refer to this over and over again, um, and, and that's a, it's a pretty broad statement. I believe this has a tendency to chill free speech, free speech that is exercised at the state and local level, typically by neighbors, by parents to local school boards. In hindsight, uh, would you agree that a natural consequence of your memo could be chilling free speech, protected speech by parents protesting local school board policies? Senator, the memo is aimed only at violence and threats of violence. 
it states on its face that vigorous debate is protected. That is what this is about, and that is all this is about. What about harassment and, and intimidation? Oh, are those federal crimes? They are federal crimes. What, 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 are, 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 are you referring to, like, witness tampering intimidation no. under 18 U.S.C. 1512? or uh, referring what? to 18 U.S.C. 2261A, which makes it a crime with intent to injure, harass, or intimidate placing a person in reasonable fear of serious bodily injury through communications uh, over the Internet. Likewise, 47 U.S.C. Uh, 223A, making telephones calls with intention to harass. Now, I want to be clear, are, though, that those only are within, I, I, I take your point, those are only within what is permitted by the First Amendment. And there, the, the Supreme Court has been clear about that, too. In the Virginia versus Black case, the court explained when intimidation is not protected by the Constitution, and that is when it is made with the intent of placing the victim in fear of bodily harm or death. So that's what we're concerned about here. Well, and one of the things that concerns me is, you know, we've got 17 attorneys general, uh, uh, led by Attorney General Todd Rakita in Nevada, and joined by a total of 17 attorneys general, including Sean Reyes, the fantastic attorney general of the state of Utah. They've weighed in and they've said they, there, there is not a, a barrage of accusations. There's no, no unusual flood of accusations of threats of violence against school board members. Nothing unusual, nothing that they can't handle at the state and local level. Uh, normally, uh, things like this uh, against state and local officials involving state and local government entities like school boards are not federal. Uh, now, <clears throat> In response to a series of questions before the House Judiciary Committee, uh, uh, including some questions asked by Congressman Jim, Jim Jordan from Ohio, you were asked your factual predicate for your October 4th memorandum and for your conclusions in this regard. You, you answered before that committee that your factual predicate for that was the October 22nd memorandum from the National School Board Association. The National School Board Association, has, has been mentioned, has since withdrawn that memo, and yet you said that was the factual predicate. Given that that was the factual predicate and that it's rescinded its memo, saying that there was no justification for some of the language that they used in that letter, will you rescind your memo? Well, Senator, I, uh, best of my recollection, I said that the impetus for the letter um, for my memorandum was that letter and also uh, reports. Um, of, of this kind of activity. What reports? I said again that uh, at the time that they were news reports um, that had um, uh, been published, and I think that uh, some of the other senators here have described some of those news reports, and we've certainly seen subsequently more news reports and more statements by board members of threats to kill them. Congressman Chip Roy of Texas uh, uh, said, uh, uh, raised in that same hearing, uh, the issue of a 14-year-old girl in a school bathroom uh, being sexually assaulted in Loudoun County. Um, and you indicated in response to that that y you weren't aware of that. And in the six days before you testified before the House Judiciary Committee, um, have you become familiar with the publicly reported details of that case? Yes, I have read about the case, yes. Um, if you were unfamiliar with the supposed instances of threats of violence and intimidation that the National School Board Association cited in the letter, then how did you determine that intervention by the FBI and the DOJ was necessary, that that was the right approach? So the right ap the approach in the letter is to meet with local law enforcement. That's what we've asked for, is to meet, to assess the situation, to see what their needs are, to strategize, uh, and to open lines of communication. Now, I'm hopeful that many areas of local law enforcement will be well able to handle this on their own. But this is the, what the Justice Department does every day. We consult with our local um, and state partners and see whether assistance is necessary. And of course, we, we continue to have our own federal responsibilities with respect to uh, uh, communications by the Internet, uh, and on social media, um, on telephone, uh, uh, through, the, uh, through, the, through the mail. But I'm hopeful that we will not be needed in this area, that our state and local uh, partners will be able to handle these threats. Uh, um, my, my time's expired. Um, I, 
I just want to state for the record as I close that my staff and I went through every news source uh, raised by the National School Board Association. There was no explicit death threat. Um, I, and uh, I choose here to reiterate my concern that um, not, every, not every outburst or expression of concern by neighbors among neighbors at a local school board meeting warrants a federal investigation certainly doesn't warrant the involvement of 94 U.S. attorneys in a way that threatens, intimidates, and tends inevitably to chill First Amendment activity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lee. Mr. Senator Coons. Mr. Chairman, Thank one, you. One, Senator, just one, second. one more request for introduction of a letter from another attorney general on rescinding the memorandum. This one from Ohio Attorney General Yost. Without objection, Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley. Thank you, Attorney General Garland. As you well know, oversight of the executive branch is an important part of the duties of this body. And so I just want to commend the chair and ranking for prioritizing this and you for your time here. Um, while at times challenging, uh, this process is key to fulfilling our constitutional responsibilities. And we know that we have substantial work to do to restore confidence in our democratic institutions. And I think uh, your engagement here today is a key part of that. So thank you for um, your diligent and thorough answers to the questions that are being presented today. Uh, let me just um, start with, with a question about some characterizations that are being made um, here and in other settings about the trajectory of the Biden administration in terms of responding to violent crime. Some are asserting that the Department of Justice uh, is focused on defunding the police or um, hamstringing or undermining uh, law enforcement. Uh, as an appropriator, my impression instead is that the president requested um, an additional $388 million for the COPS hiring program, an increase of $200 million over the previous year. The CJS uh, probes uh, that was just uh, posted includes $100 million for new community violence intervention programs. Um, and the Biden administration ensured that over $350 billion um, previously um, available grants under the CARES Act could be used to hire more law enforcement personnel at the state and local level, even beyond pre-pandemic levels. Could you just speak briefly um, to how these different programs and initiatives are, in fact, um, designed to prevent violent crime, designed to support our state and local partners, uh, and how these investments could work to assist, support, and protect law enforcement um, in conducting them, their, their obligations and duties in our communities in an appropriate way? Uh, yes, Senator. I thought that... Uh, I would just add one more um, uh, pile of uh, requests there, which was uh, for over $500 million for the Burn JAG grants, which also go uh, directly to state and local uh, law enforcement. So, yes, um, look, we are very concerned about violent crime. Um, this is an area um, which is primarily, the resp again, primarily the responsibility of state and local law enforcement, but nonetheless has bipartisan support has had this since the 1990s for federal government involvement uh, to help prevent. Uh, we are, as a consequence, uh, we have historically since then and uh, uh, accelerating uh, now, uh, lashed up with our state and local partners in uh, task forces uh, uh, and, and joint um, organizations in every city and every community uh, in the United States to help our local law enforcement uh, protect their communities against violence. We also have federal, um, uh, obviously, um, uh, laws which help us in this regard. Um, and um, these include money that we've requested for DEA, for ATF, for the FBI, for the Marshal Service, all increases to allow us to support uh, these circumstances. And as we've discussed before, um, my hometown is uh, one where I was responsible for local law enforcement when I was an elected county official. Uh, we appreciate these additional investments in the partnership with federal law enforcement and think it's an important part of our work to combat violent crime all over this country. Um, I want to turn to immigration. You've been asked by a number of my colleagues about it. There seem to be some who think that uh, anything we do to help migrants uh, will necessarily make the border less secure, more chaotic, but I, I disagree. I think it is possible for us to reduce multi-year court backlogs, improve access to counsel, improve um, the humanitarian aspects of handling uh, migrants, um, and build a system that is um, orderly, consistent with the rule of law, more humane and more fair. Um, I'd love to understand how we in Congress uh, can help you through legislation, 
as well as through funding to reduce immigration court backlogs, improve access to counsel, improve the um, process, um, and also contribute to securing our southern border. Um, do you have thoughts you care to share briefly, or would you be willing to share those with us uh, in writing? Well, I'll be happy to um, uh, have the department get back to you in writing, but I, I will say we have uh, requested additional funds so that we can put an additional 600 personnel, including 100 immigration judges, uh, into our Executive Office of Immigration Review so that we can do the kind of acceleration uh, that you're talking about. We've made a number of internal changes with respect to the way cases are handled in order to accelerate that. But we do need more money uh, in that respect, and, and I've made that plea uh, already to the Appropriations Committee. But we'd be happy to get back to you with more detail. And, and, and just superficially, um, is it your understanding that when applicants for asylum have access to counsel or to legal counseling, the odds that they return for their final disposition and the odds that um, they will have a fair and appropriate process go up? Well, I certainly think the odds that they have a fair and appropriate um, uh, process uh, would go up. I, I, it seems quite logical that the odds of them returning for their proceedings would go up because they would know they would have that opportunity. I don't know any of the statistics about that. Though. Understood. Um, on intellectual property, as you know, long a concern of mine, I just briefly wanted to mention uh, back in December of 2019, DOJ Antitrust issued a statement jointly with NIST and the Department of Commerce and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, um, recognizing that when a patent involved in voluntary standard-setting efforts, these are typically global efforts around uh, critical communications technologies and others, that all legal remedies should be available when a patent's infringed. Um, and that policy ensures competition, incentivizes participation in standard-setting activities, and plays a vital role in bringing uh, the benefits of innovation to Americans. Uh, it's also critical for our global competition with China and other countries. Um, I'm hearing DOJ has imminent plans to abandon that position or reverse it and replace it with one that um, does not embrace the availability of all remedies. Um, given that there are nominees uh, in process, uh, likely now for both AAG for um, antitrust and now for Patent and Trademark Office, um, would you commit to waiting until there are Senate-confirmed leaders in these positions before a change in policy? I would love to have Senate-confirmed uh, leadership uh, in the antitrust division, and everything you can do to make that go swifter would be greatly appreciated. I, I don't I have to say this is a bit outside the area of my own expertise, but nothing. I assume any such thing would have to come through me before it would be announced. Nothing like that has come uh, to my office yet. Well, I'd, I'd welcome the opportunity to stay in communication with it. My, my last quick question um, relates to the Office for Access to Justice, which uh, has in the past, under a previous administration, been a leader in uh, debtors' prisons and the criminalization of poverty. Uh, tomorrow, this committee will hold uh, a vote on the Driving for Opportunity Act, a bipartisan bill I'm leading with Senator Wicker and a number of members of this committee, um, and it will make progress in terms of um, ways in which um, um, a, a decades-old practice of stripping people of their uh, driver's licenses for unpaid court-related fees or um, fines, um, which advances the criminalization of poverty, will be reversed. Um, could you say just a moment about the plans for the Office of Access to Justice and your view about the importance of uh, continued progress in criminal justice reform? Uh, yes, Senator. Uh, 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 equal justice under law is inscribed in the pediment above the Supreme Court and is a core principle of, of American democracy. But you can't have equal justice under law if you don't have access to justice. And for much of my career as a judge, and even before that, uh, even before uh, being in the Justice Department, uh, and, and in addition, even as a lawyer in private practice, I've been concerned about getting access to attorneys uh, so that lawyers, uh, so that uh, people who uh, need help with their individual circumstances uh, can have assistance. Um, the President issued an executive order on this. Um, we have, um, um, and there is a report, I'm not positive whether it's public, but I, be I believe it is, with respect to reinvigorating the roundtable, uh, whose job it is to address this question, of which I believe I'm a co-chair. We are, uh, I asked for a review within the department, and we have determined that we should stand up once again uh, an independent, within the department, uh, Office of Access to Justice. We have enough money uh, to do that in the very short term, but our, um, not to talk too much about requests for money, 
but our FY22 uh, budget request uh, does ask uh, for a significant appropriation so that we can uh, stand up a staff uh, and get that office uh, going. Great. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Coons. The uh, committee is going to stand in recess for five minutes. When we return, Senator Cotton is up if he is here. If not, Senator Kennedy.
Senate Judiciary Committee will resume. Senator Cotton is recognized. Judge Garland, on May 11th, Tony Fauci testified that his agency, quote, has not ever and does not now fund gain-of-function research in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Last week, his agency admitted that they had, in fact, funded gain-of-research uh, in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Are you investigating Tony Fauci for lying to Congress? So the long-time rule in the Justice Department not to discuss pending investigations, potential investigations. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Um, do you believe Tony Fauci was truthful when he said his agency had never funded gain-of-function research? This is outside of my scope of okay. knowledge. Let, let's turn to your outrageous directive sicking the feds on parents at school boards across America. When you crafted that October 4th memo, did you consult with senior leadership at the FBI? My understanding was that the memo um, or the idea of the memo had been discussed with the FBI before. It did anyone at the FBI express any doubt or disagreement or hesitation with your decision to issue that memo? No one expressed that to me. No one? To me. No one expressed that to me, no. Because a lot of them have contacted us and they said they did, Judge. I'm sorry? A lot of FBI officials have contacted my office and said that they oppose this decision. Well, I doubt any of them spoke to me about it because I didn't speak to, to uh, no one. All right. Made that All right. To me. Uh, Judge, you've repeatedly, you've repeatedly dissembled this morning about that directive. For instance, about the National Security Division. Chuck Grassley asked you a very simple question, why you would sick the National Security Division of the Department of Justice on parents. John Cornyn asked you the same thing. You said it wasn't in your October 4th memorandum, it was in another office's memorandum. It was another office's memorandum, Judge. It was in a press release from your office, right here in front of me, October 4th, 2021, for immediate release. You're gonna create a task force that includes the National Security Division. What on earth does the National Security Division have to do with parents who are expressing disagreements at school boards? Nothing in this memorandum or any memorandum is about parents expressing disagreements with their school boards. The memorandum makes clear that uh, parents are entitled and protected by the First Amendment to have vigorous debates. We don't, uh, uh, the Justice Department is not interested in that question at all. It is oh, okay, so even in that case, what, what is the National Security Division, Judge? The these are the people that are supposed to be chasing jihadists and Chinese spies. What does the National Security Division have to do with parents? at school boards. This is not, again, about parents at school boards. This is about threats of violence. Okay, let me, let me turn to that because you've said that phrase repeatedly throughout the morning. Threats or violence and threats of violence. Violence and threats of violence. Yeah. We've heard it a dozen times this morning. As Senator Lee pointed out, the very first line in your October 4th memorandum refers to harassment and intimidation. Why do you continue to dissemble in front of this committee that you are only talking about violence and threats of violence when your memo says harassment and intimidation? Senator, I said in, it, uh, in my testimony that it involved other kinds of criminal conduct, and, the, and I explained to Senator Lee that the uh, statutory definitions of those terms and the constitutional definitions of those terms involve threats of violence. Okay, let's look at one of those statutes you cited, yeah. Section 223. Yeah. That statute covers the use of not just telephones, but telecommunications devices to annoy, to annoy someone. So are, are you going to sick your U.S. attorneys and the FBI on a parents group if they post on Facebook something that annoys a school board member, well, Judge? The answer to that is no, and the, the provision that I was particularly uh, drawing to his attention was 2261A which was to engage in- I wasn't talking about 2261A. I know you mentioned that. You also mentioned 223. That's what I mentioned. Yeah, but the only okay, kind- Judge, you also, told, you also told Senator Klobuchar that this memorandum was about meetings and coordination. Yeah. Meetings and coordination. Yeah. Well, I have in my hand right here that I'll submit to the record a letter from one of your U.S. attorneys to all of the county attorneys, to the attorney general, to all sheriffs, to the school board association of his state, in which he talks about federal investigation and prosecution. It's not about meetings, it's not about coordination, it's about federal investigation and prosecution. Did you, did you direct your U.S. attorneys to issue such a letter? I did not. I have not seen that letter. My it's got three pages. It's got three pages well, my of spreadsheet my about all the federal crimes that a, that a parent could be charged with, to include the ones you cited. Did, did, 
My memorandum. Did Maine Justice make this spreadsheet, Judge? I don't have any idea. Uh, my memorandum speaks specifically about setting up meetings, and I'll just read it again, convene meetings. Judge, we, we've all read your memorandum. Well, we've also you heard you dissemble it. about your memorandum. I have, I have, and the record now shows, one of your U.S. attorneys sending out a letter about federal prosecution investigation and list in detail the federal statutes for which you could be prosecuted. Judge, you've talked a lot about intimidation and harassment. Have you issued a memorandum like your October 4th memorandum about the Black Lives Matter rights from last summer? You're talking about the, the summer of 2020? In the summer of 2020, there a were a lot of crimes committed. People haven't been charged with crimes yet. There were a lot of and they were under the previous administration. Okay, Judge, they what about this? You, it is no doubt, you're, 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 even though parents at school boards aren't within federal jurisdiction, there's no doubt that federal officials are. You keep saying senators. Have you started an investigation into the harassment of Senator Kirsten Sinema in a bathroom? In a bathroom, because she won't go along with the Democratic Party's big tax and spend agenda? That is a sitting United States senator being harassed in a bathroom. I don't know whether the senator has referred the matter to the Justice Department or not. You've cited as the basis for that directive the National School Board Association's letter of September 29th. Was that directive being prepared before September 29th, before the School Board Association letter was issued? I don't believe so. Certainly, I didn't have any idea. So it was only prepared at – okay, I think that answers the question. I already answered that so, question So you, you keep citing the school board letter and news reports. That's news right. One of the news right. reports cited in that letter, which you presumably mean, is from Loudoun County, Virginia. No, that's Scott, not – that is not um, uh, what I was talking about. Well, talking it, about you keep citing news reports, and no. that's the most prominent news report that anyone in America has seen. That refers to Scott Smith, whose 15-year-old daughter was raped. She was raped – in a bathroom by a boy wearing girls' clothes, and the Loudoun County School Board covered it up because it would have interfered with their transgendered policy during Pride Month. And that man, Scott Smith, because he went to a school board and tried to defend his daughter's rights, was condemned internationally. Do you apologize to Scott Smith and his 15-year-old daughter, Judge? Senator, anyone who's a uh, child was raped as uh, is a, the most horrific crime I can imagine and is certainly entitled and protected by the First Amendment to c protest to their school board about that. But he was that cited is, by the School Board Association that's fine, as a domestic that's not, terrorist, which we now know that letter and those reports were the basis for your judgment. No, Th this no is, Senator, this is that's wrong. Shameful. Judge, that's, this is shameful. This, here, this testimony, your directive, your performance is shameful. Okay. That's not Th correct. Thank God you are not on the Supreme Court. You that, should resign in disgrace, Judge. General Garland, do you want to complete your answer? On okay, I wasn't sure there was a question there, but let me be clear. The, the news reports I'm talking about were not the news reports in that letter. They were other news reports that everybody here has heard about, subsequent reports that everybody has heard about. We are – there is nothing in this memorandum, and I wish if senators were concerned about this, they would quote my words. This memorandum is not about – parents being able to object in their school boards. They are protected by the First Amendment. As long as there are no threats of violence, they are completely protected. So parents can object to their school boards about curriculum, about the treatment of their children, um, about school policies. All of that is 100 percent protected by the First Amendment, and there is nothing in this memorandum contrary to that. We are only trying to prevent violence against school officials. Thank you. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to insert into the record the um, a Washington Post article by Salvador Rizzo that is entitled, The False GOP Claim That the Depart Justice Department is Spying on Parents at School Board Meetings. I'd like to insert this article into the record. Without objection. It's good to see you, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you. I will quote from the first sentence of your memo. In recent months, there has been a disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threat of violence against school administrators, board members, teachers, and staff who participate in the vital work of running our nation's public schools. This is a fact. We have all seen the news coverage 
of people actually threatening to hurt school board members for going about their jobs. That is a fact. So when I listen to my Republican colleagues uh, going on about the, the intent of this memo, I'm again reminded of that they often take the position to not believe what we, uh, that we should all not believe what we see with our own eyes. It's like characterizing the January 6th insurrection as just a bunch of tourists visiting the Capitol. Give me a break. We now see a Supreme Court weaponized to support the position of the most conservative causes. We see a rush to the Supreme Court on cases involving abortion rights, gun rights, LGBTQ rights, voting rights, union rights. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for making the protection of our civil rights one of the department's core priorities. I want to turn to uh, the need to combat hate crimes. It's been about five months since President Biden signed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act into law, and I sent a letter to you last month requesting an update on the department's implementation of the act and its efforts to reduce hate crimes and hate incidents. Yet another thing that we have all seen with our own eyes, the rise in hate crimes during this period of the pandemic. Mr. Attorney General, would you briefly describe the actions that you and the department have taken thus far to implement the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act? Thank you, Senator. Um, even before the act, I had issued a memorandum within the department uh, to assess how we were dealing with uh, hate crimes and to better uh, organize the manner in which we were doing that. And then um, we're grateful um, that the Congress passed um, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. Uh, since then, I issued an, uh, a subsequent memorandum based on what the Associate Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General had provided uh, in terms of the Department's progress under that act. And I believe we have now implemented everything uh, that was required of us in the act. But that, of course, doesn't mean we've solved hate in America. Mm -hmm. But we have done the things that the statute has asked us to do. We have. I've appointed a coordinator for all hate crimes matters. I've, appoint, uh, uh, um, I've appointed a uh, expediter in the Civil Rights Division's uh, criminal section to expedite our investigations. Uh, we've established a task force um, um, of federal law enforcement and um, U.S. Attorney's offices meeting with state and local law enforcement uh, to coordinate, to explain, to develop strategies with respect to hate crimes. We've had trainings for state and local, uh, territorial, um, and tribal law enforcement to help them recognize um, these circumstances. Um, we've asked, uh, uh, we've established a, a language coordinator, a uh, facilitator, um, so that um, our, our um, memorandum and press releases in these regards can be translated appropriately. And we've asked for a considerable additional funds in our appropriations uh, so that we may give more money to state and locals, uh, tribal um, and territorial uh, law enforcement to assist in these matters. I appreciate the, the efforts you have, you have taken, and I, I, I think that this will result in, of course, some factual information about the, incident, the, the extent of hate crimes and incidents in our country so that we can better prevent and uh, prosecute as uh, appropriate. You've been asked before, I think in, in the House hearing, about the China in initiative. If we end the China initiative, will we no longer go after economic espionage and uh, uh, IP threat by China? There, there are two issues here that we always have to keep um, um, uppermost in our mind. Uh, one is that uh, the People's Republic of China is a serious threat to our intellectual property. They're, they represent a serious uh, threat with respect to uh, espionage. They represent a serious respect with respect to uh, cyber incursions and ransomware uh, in the United States. Um, um, and and um, we need to protect uh, the country against this. Um, 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 and, and we will and we are, are bringing cases in that regard. Uh, the other thing that always has to be uh, uh, remembered um, is that uh, we never um, investigate or prosecute based on um, uh, ethnic identity, uh, on what country a person is from or came from or their family. Thank you. I'm sorry, were you, were you done? 
Uh, the reason I ask about the China Initiative is, is that uh, under the previous administration, which instituted this so-called initiative, that uh, there appears to have been um, racial profiling, which basically ruined the lives of a number of Chinese people. And I want to give an example. The Justice Department, previous administration, dragged Dr. An Ming Hu, a professor at the University of Tennessee, through a two-year espionage investigation, causing him to lose his job. At the end of the investigation, DOJ lacked any evidence of espionage and instead charged Dr. Hu with wire fraud and false statements for apparently failing to disclose his association with a Chinese university on a NASA grant application. His trial ended in a mistrial, after which a juror said she was, quote, pretty horrified by the lack of evidence, end quote. When DOJ sought a new trial, the district court granted Dr. Hu's motion for an acquittal, finding no harm to NASA and no evidence that Dr. Hu knew NASA's funding restriction applied to Chinese universities. So I would say from your answer that regardless of whether we have something called the Chinese Initiative, you have no intention of not paying attention to espionage and other bad acts by China. So I'd say we should get rid of this, this, what? This initiative that results in racial profiling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kennedy. Good morning, General. Good morning, Senator. Oh, there's a lot that I couldn't get to. General, I'm, I'm looking at this letter from one of your U.S. attorneys from October this year, where he wrote to the uh, Montana Attorney General, all the county attorneys and all the sheriffs in his jurisdiction, suggesting ways that parents could be prosecuted. At school board mayor, uh, for, for appearing at school board meetings in accordance with your directive. And one of the uh, suggestions made by your U.S. attorney is parents can be prosecuted for repeated telephone calls, not threatening anyone, just on the theory that repeated telephone calls could be harassment. Really? Senator, I haven't seen that memorandum. I've, I've tried to express as clearly as I can here. I, I, I heard you, General, but this is one of your U.S. attorneys. Senator, you're thinking of Again, I haven't seen... Isn't that special? General, you're just a vessel. Sure. Well, let, let, let me tell you what I'm talking about. With respect to the national school boards association letter, you're just a vessel, aren't you? I'm not sure what you mean by that, but I signed this memorandum. I worked on this memorandum, and this memorandum is my memorandum. Well, let me, let me tell you what I mean. We, we know that the National School Board Association was upset because parents were coming to school board meetings to object to the teaching of critical race theory. We know that uh, in drafting the letter, the National School Board Association collaborated with the White House for several weeks. They worked on it together. And we know that the National School Board Association, once the White House and the, the association were happy with the letter, the National School Board Association sent the letter to the White House, and the White House promptly called you and said, sick the FBI on parents at school board hearings. And that's what I mean. That, 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 that the White House is the prophet here. You're just the vessel. Isn't that correct? Senator, I did not speak with anyone from the White House as while I worked on this memorandum. This memorandum reflects my views that we need to protect public officials from violence and threats of violence while at the same time protecting parents' ability to object to policies. Right. I, I get that. I, I heard your with. testimony. Were you worried that you would be fired if you didn't issue the memorandum? 
Senator, I'm not. <laughs> I, I, I decided on this memorandum on my own. I don't care. Um, I, I said from the very beginning, I've taken this job uh, to uh, protect the Department of Justice, to make independent determinations with respect uh, to prosecutions and investigations, and I will do that. Okay. I'm not I'm sorry to interrupt, fire. General, but I don't have much time. Um, now, when you when you got the letter that from the White House that that prompted your memorandum to give the FBI new duties and making sure our parents aren't dangerous domestic terrorists. You didn't investigate before you issued your, your memorandum the incidences cited in the letter, did you? Look, I took the uh, a statement by the National Association, which represents thousands of school board members, um, when they said that they were facing violence and threats of violence, and when I saw in the news media reports yeah, but you didn't investigate the incidents in the letter, did you? No, there were, this is the first step. This is an assessment step. It comes before investigations. The, the purpose right. Is before you issued your memo, you didn't investigate the incidents. The memo, the memo is intend, intended to begin assessments. It is intended and, to ask. And, in fact, m most of the incidents in the letter were, did not involve threats of violence, did they? I think that's correct. Most of them did not, yeah. and they would not be covered by either federal or state law. I agree with that, and they would be protected by the First Amendment. But threats of violence are not covered by the can, can we agree that we have thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of kids growing up today who are more likely to commit a crime than, uh, than, than, and go to jail than own a home or get married. I don't, I don't know about the comparative statistics. I do know there are too many people who are committing crimes. And one of the reasons for that is lack of parental involvement, isn't it? I think parental involvement is essential. I think it's the key both to bringing up good kids. So, uh, so why do you want to issue a memorandum listing incidents that you didn't investigate, my, my that memo. anybody who has any fair-minded knowledge of the world knows is going to have a chilling effect on parental involvement with respect to what their kids are learning at school. I just want to be clear again, Senator. My memorandum did not list any of those incidents. Come on, General. We both know this had a chilling effect. You don't think there are parents out there in the real world that said, oh, my God, maybe we, we, we shouldn't go to the school board meeting. There'll be FBI agents there. My, my we live in a this isn't La La Land. I tried to make clear as clear as I could, and now I have subsequently made clear in every public statement on the matter. Your, your actions yeah. made it clear, General. Let me ask you one last question. When men follow a United States senator who happens to be a female into a, a women's room to harass her about her beliefs. Why is that just part of the process, as President Biden says? But when a parent goes to a school board meeting to protest that her child is being taught that babies are, can be white supremacists is subject to FBI prosecution. The description that you just gave, that parent is not subject to FBI investigation, and there's nothing in this memorandum that suggests this. We protect United States senators against threats of violence. You did a good job with Senator Sinema. Within the last month, we have indicted somebody who made threats of violence against both Alaska U.S. senators. Recently, we just issued, uh, we just indicted can, somebody can, else who made threats of violence. Can I ask one more, Mr. Congress. Chairman? Can you wrap up, please, Senator Kennedy? I'm sorry? C could you wrap up? I am chairing this. Oh, panel. yes, ma'am. I, I, I will. I'm just going to ask uh, one last one. Um, What led you to conclude before you issued your memorandum seeking the FBI on parents that law enforcement at the state and local level couldn't handle it? 
Let me be clear, Senator. We did not sick the FBI on parents. That's not what this memorandum is about. Nor did we conclude that local law enforcement is unable to deal with the problem. The purpose of this memorandum is for our federal law enforcement to engage with state and local and determine whether they need assistance. And you don't think this had any chilling effect whatsoever Look, on I, parents out there? I, the memorandum expressly says at the beginning that it is aimed at violence and threats of violence and expressly says that robust public debate about school policies are protected. Right, right. Well, I like you, General, a lot, but Thank you, on this issue, you've turned into Senator someone Kennedy. you said you wouldn't be. I recognize Senator Booker. Please proceed. General, um, I want to start with an area of bipartisan uh, accord. It seems to be what we're getting towards. Um, today's the 35th anniversary of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, which established vastly different uh, sentences for crack and powder cocaine. Uh, we are seeing a, a wonderful convergence uh, in Congress, most recently in the House of Representatives, where you had this wide bipartisan vote. I'm not sure if there's been a bigger bipartisan vote this year, where 149 Republicans voted along with almost all the Democratic caucus to, uh, to address this disparity. Um, the, the effect of that law was 100 to 1, the work of uh, again, uh, bipartisan senators here, negotiate, led by Senator Durbin, negotiated uh, the Fair Sentencing Act, which was a, a change of that disparity from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. Uh, Senator Durbin and I now have introduced something called the Equal Act, which, uh, which has already been passed by the House. We've got Republicans and Democrats on board, Tillis, Leahy, uh, Paul, Graham, uh, as well as uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Ossoff, on, uh, on my side of the aisle. Uh, the President, uh, Biden, publicly supported the bill. And uh, again, uh, I just think this is, should be an area that's an obvious uh, uh, accord. Uh, but I really want to know your opinion. Do you agree that it's time to end the sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine, uh, especially given the disparate impact it has on people of color? And if you believe that, why do you believe that? Yes, I, I do believe that, that the Justice Department supports that bill, that supports uh, equal treatment of uh, crack and powder cocaine. The Sentencing Commission has, over the last decade, maybe more than that, produced a series of reports which undercut what was supposed to be the scientific basis for the distinction between the two, and it's made quite clear that there is no uh, warrant uh, basis uh, for uh, distinguishing between the two. So once that is undercut, there's going to be no grounds for that. On the other hand, on the other side, not only are there no grounds for it, it, it clearly does have a disparate impact on communities of color, also clearly um, recognized by the Sentencing Commission statistics. You have that kind of circumstances. There's no justification for this, and we should end this. I appreciate that. One last uh, just clarification. While there is a lot of unanimous support for this on both sides of the aisle, a lot of support for it on both sides of the aisle, um, there are some people that, that worry about it somehow affecting crime or crime rates. Could you uh, discuss your opinion of that perspective? Well, I, I think uh, powder uh, cocaine uh, is as dangerous with respect to crime rates as crack cocaine, uh, both of which have now been uh, unfortunately overtaken um, by fentanyl uh, and uh, and uh, the opioids, um, but um, both of those are uh, uh, bad problems from the spectrum of crime, but equalizing uh, penalties for crack and powder should have no uh, difference with respect to our ability to fight uh, violent crime. Or Can I, crime. Thank, thank you, sir. I appreciate that you saying that for the record. Can I revisit what uh, Senator Durbin brought up at the top? And this is a letter that he and I sent you regarding uh, uh, the, the people that are currently on home confinement in the last days of the Trump administration on January 15, 2021, the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel issued a memo arguing that the BOP must re-incarcerate everyone on the CARES Act home confinement uh, at the end of the covered emergency period if they do not otherwise qualify for home confinement. Now, these are folks that were pretty uh, extremely scrutinized beforehand. They've been returned to their communities. They have been re-engaging with family, uh, with children. They have uh, are folks that are not showing any criminal activity or any problems. Uh, 
uh, Senator Durbin and I uh, uh, really believe, and we were urging uh, the Department of Justice to rescind uh, this Trump era memo, um, which incorrectly concludes that people who have been released to home confinement and who have abided by the conditions of their relief, relief must be torn away from those families uh, and go back to uh, BOP custody. And so I, I just really uh, would love to know where you stand on this issue. Uh, to me, it's, it's an issue of justice. It's an issue of restorative justice. It's an issue of compassion. Uh, and understanding uh, the collateral consequences of ripping people back and putting them in prisons unnecessarily, uh, not to mention the, the cost to taxpayers. Uh, clearly, I have my opinion, but I'd like to hear yours. Okay. I, I, I agree with you. It would be a terrible policy to return uh, these people to prison after they have shown uh, that they are able to live in uh, home confinement without uh, uh, violations. Um, and as a consequence, we are reviewing the OLC memorandum that you spoke about. We are also reviewing all of the other authorities that Congress may have given us uh, to permit us to keep people on home confinement. And uh, uh, as you know, we are also, uh, and the President is uh, reviewing the extent of his clemency authority in that respect. How, how long should we expect that review before you make a well, determination? I, 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 I can't say exactly. But, uh, Am I, are we talking six months or, or less than six I, months? I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure how long that will take. Uh, it may require rulemaking, uh, um, and, and so that may take more time. But uh, we can be sure that it will be accomplished before the end of the CARES Act provision, which extends till the end of the pandemic. And, and so we are not in a circumstance where anybody will be returned before we have completed that review and implemented any changes we need to make. Okay, and then in regards to just compassionate release in general, will the Department of Justice consider filing motions for individuals on home confinement who reside in judicial districts like the 11th Circuit, uh, where courts have interpreted compassionate release statutes to cover only medical age and family circumstances grounds? Obviously, there's still a pandemic, and we know that putting people into environments uh, greatly increases their chances. I'm concerned uh, about um, uh, restrictions in, on compassionate release in places like the 11th Circuit. Well, this is something I haven't thought about, Senator. I, um, we, I guess the uh, Bureau of Prisons, which is uh, the agency that, uh, that, that decides those questions, um, has to have a uniform policy across the country. I hadn't thought of the possibility of making distinctions based on uh, which um, uh, a circuit, because you're quite correct, the different circuits have different views about the scope of compassionate release. I'll take that back for consideration if it's all right with you. All right, I have some concerns about uh, First Step Act implementation, which I'll, I'll ask in writing to you. I want to be respectful of my colleague, my friend, uh, the senator uh, from the great state of Oklahoma. Ouch. I'm sorry, <laughs> sir. I, forgive me, Omaha. <laughs> Omaha's not a state, brother. I'm sorry. Where are you from, sir? We used to be able to beat Stanford in football, and we will return. <laughs> Chairwoman, yeah, thank you. Sorry, Corey's not as funny as, as I thought he would be there. Um, Attorney General, um, I know you're tired of talking about the memo. I'm not. But did you say you're not? I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, sir. Um, I think most of us and most of the American people are just sort of flabbergasted if your answer is you have no regrets about this memo. Is that what you're telling us? You think this was wise? Senator, the obligation of the Justice Department is to protect the American people against violence, including threats of violence, and that particularly includes public officials. I think that is still a, a, a concern for the department. This memo doesn't do anything more than ask our, lo our, our law enforcement to consult with state and local law enforcement to determine whether they need um, assistance in this regard and whether there are any federal jurisdictional issues involved. Um, the General, recognize you, the right you and I both know um, that it is political hackery that brought that topic to your desk, not reality. I am strongly against all violence against everyone in public life and all threats of violence. You've not at any point here given us any data that show why this would in any way be a federal priority at this time. The chairman, not here right now, but Chairman Durbin has repeatedly talked about how this morning he Googled it and is pretty convinced there must be lots of threats. Can you help us understand why 
so many states are disconnecting their organizations from the National Association of School Boards. You, you are aware that the National Association of School Boards has recanted of the memo, correct? You know they've, they've rejected their own letter to you, or you're aware of that? I read their letter. Their letter doesn't recant their concerns about safety. It recants some of the language in their letter. We're all for I, safety. Which I did not adopt. The language that they have recanted, I never adopted and never would adopt. Why did the Ohio School Boards Association sever their relationship with the National School Boards Association? Uh, I don't know. And Why did the Missouri School Boards Association sever their relationship with the National School Boards Association? Why did the Pennsylvania School Boards Association sever their relationship with the National School Boards Association? Because this was political hackery. The kind of stuff you told us when you were seeking confirmation that you would be against. And you had the audacity to begin your opening statement today by telling us one of your big three priorities was to make sure communications between the White House and the Justice Department were not politicized. The last three administrations in a row have politicized the Department of Justice, the three including you now. You told us one of your priorities in running DOJ was to reject the kinds of politicization we saw in the Trump DOJ and in the Obama DOJ. You told us that was one of your priorities. You wrote a memo here that came from political staffers who've been rejected by their own organization, coordinating with the White House to try to exaggerate a threat so that they could make sure parents felt intimidated. You've told us, I wouldn't use the exact language Senator Kennedy used about that you were a vessel, but one of two things is true here. Either you were just a vessel of political comm staffers at the White House, or you yourself are in favor of politicizing the DOJ. You told one of my colleagues a minute ago that you've not read the memo from the U.S. Attorney for Montana. I'll read it to you if you want, or I'll bring it to you and you can read it. This is one of your direct reports. It's an insane letter. The U.S. Attorney for Montana takes as predicate for why he's doing what he's doing your memo, and on October 14th, he sends a list of all the counterterrorism statutes that should be considered to be used against parents who are upset about things that might be happening at their school boards. Maybe there's lots of specific evidence of violence being threatened against school board members in Montana. But he, his memo, or his response to your memo, includes a letter where he says that anonymous telecommunications harassment, repeated telephone calls, or repeated harassing communications should be things that are potentially brought up as the basis for federal charges against parents. Do you agree with this letter of October 14th? Senator, I'm going to say again, this is aimed at violence and threats of violence, and I don't care whether they come from the left or from the right or from up or from down. I don't care if they're in favor of curriculum or against a particular kinds of a curriculum. We can imagine this, all these kind of um, these arguments against school boards coming from either the left or the right, it doesn't matter. Arguments against school boards are protected by the First Amendment. Threats are not protected by the First Amendment. And um, we, I, we, got, we received a letter from the National Association of School Boards. No reason to believe. You didn't receive an anonymous letter. White House political staff co-wrote it with this organization, which is why the organization has rejected it. You know these facts now to be true, and yet you still won't disavow your memo. Why? You didn't receive some objective, neutral letter because all these people were being threatened. You are, the res you are responding to a political campaign to politicize the Department of Justice. How big is the threat that American parents pose right now? When you, you lead a big organization, you have 100,000 plus employees. You have a lot of violence to go after. Are parents at school boards one of the top three concerns you face right now? This memorandum is not about parents at school boards. It doesn't matter whether they're parents or anyone else. It has to do with threats against public school teachers, public official, school officials. It is not political. I'm against all those threats. I want to know what the data is. Well, I don't need data in order to assess. To respond data. to a political but, staffer's no, campaign out of the White House. The purpose of this memorandum is to get our law enforcement to assess the extent of the problem. And if there is no problem, if states and local uh, law enforcement are capable of handling the problem, then there is no need for our involvement. If this memo does not say to begin uh, prosecuting anybody. 
It says to make assessments. That's what we do in the Justice Department. It has nothing to do with politics. Will you report back to this committee with what you find about these threats? Because what you just said, I completely agree with. We are against violence against public officials. You and I agree. We are against threats of violence against public officials. You and I agree. We are for local police powers investigating local crimes. And there are definitely yokels and idiots that make threats against lots of people in public life. I don't minimize it. You shouldn't minimize it. You're not minimizing it. But we both believe and in your heart of hearts, I'm pretty sure you believe that local law enforcement is more than able to handle some one idiot or 12 idiots at school board meetings. But you made it a federal issue, and I don't have any idea why, and at no point today have you offered us a shred of data. So my question is, will you pledge you will report back to this committee with the results of your investigation about how big a threat the American parent class is to school boards in the country? I will be happy to get a report back to you, but it, this is not about the American parent. I know. It's about the politicization of DOJ, and you decided to submit as a vessel, and you know better. I'm sorry, but I don't agree with that, Senator. Thank you, uh, Senator Horomo. Welcome to our committee, Mr. Attorney General, and let me just begin by thanking you and your team for the sense of integrity and transparency that you brought to the Department of Justice after a time when the rule of law in the greatest law enforcement agency in the history of the world was gravely threatened by a lack of that dedication and commitment. I think it's very important what you have done, even though we may have differences of opinion, we may disagree, but uh, nobody can doubt your commitment to the rule of law. I want to ask you uh, about a matter. I know you're familiar with it. Uh, last month, the committee held a hearing on the FBI's mishandling of the Nasser investigation, Larry Nasser, who was convicted of the most heinous kind of abuse with respect to young athletes and gymnasts, particularly. Four brave women shared their stories with us. They showed up to tell those stories in spite of the very grave obstacles. The Inspector General concluded that two FBI agents made false statements during their investigation into Nasser and to the IG himself, the Inspector General, during an investigation, the FBI agents lied. He referred those cases to the Department of Justice. What I'd like to ask is that the Department of Justice now, in effect, show up by providing an explanation of whatever its decision is with respect to the prosecution of those agents. The Deputy Attorney General announced that the Criminal Division was conducting a new review, as you know, and that new information has come to light. While we wait for that review to be completed, what I'm seeking from you is a commitment that you will explain the decision when it's made. I recognize as a former prosecutor that declinations typically are not explained, but the Justice Manual itself says that in criminal civil rights cases, quote, it is often the practice to send case closing notification letters in cases closed with indictment or prosecution because cases, quote, often spark intense public interest, even when they're not prosecuted, and that such letters are, quote, particularly encouraged in cases of police misconduct and other cases involving law enforcement officer subjects, end quote. In this case, we have exactly that situation, and I'm asking for a commitment that you will provide an explanation for your decision. Well, Senator, this, this is a hard problem for us. The part of the manual that you're talking about is about um, uh, violations of the Civil Rights Act, and, and what we're talking about here are false statements. Um, needless to say, if the result of this review um, is a prosecution, that will become public. Uh, on the question of how much, um, whether and how much we can say if all we do is decline, I'm just going to have to take that back for consideration. I, I take your point, and uh, I will think about it very carefully, as will uh, the Criminal Division. I understand you're not ruling it out, but I'm going to continue to press for 
an explanation. I think the gymnasts deserve it, so does the American public. And I hope that you will make a decision to provide a full and complete explanation, because I think the credibility of the decision will largely depend on it. And let me just say, uh, in my view, we need to do more than focus on the FBI agents at, that the Inspector General referred for prosecution, because this failure was an institutional failure. Institutional to the FBI, to USA Gymnastics, and the entire Olympic system. It was an institutional breakdown. And to date, there's been no accountability for anyone in power. To that end, I am announcing that I, in the Commerce Subcommittee that I chair, the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection, we're going to continue the work that Senator Moran and I began years ago. We literally began it years ago with the investigation and Olympics reform legislation. We're going to engage in further oversight of the United States Olympic and Paralympics Committee, the national governing bodies, and safe sport to ensure their purported commitment to safety is not an empty promise. The gymnasts have asked us. They deserve us. They deserve it. And we're going to fulfill that obligation. But in my view, the Department of Justice has to do more as well, given the FBI's gross mishandling of the Nasser investigation. I believe a new review of all of the information related to Nasser and the USOPC more broadly is warranted here, because there are other examples of potential misconduct that deserve a fresh look. For instance, Senator Moran and I referred the former CEO of the USOPC to the Department of Justice for potentially perjuring himself before our subcommittee in 2018. We don't know what, if anything, the department did with that referral. We've heard virtually nothing. In addition, the former U U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Indiana, whose office was involved in the Nasser investigation, is now representing one of the disgraced FBI agents. He's representing one of the FBI agents referred for prosecution. I don't know whether that's a violation of ethical rules or some other kinds of Department of Justice policies, but it raises significant questions, and the Department should have an interest in them. So I hope that we can expect more from you by way of explanation, and I hope that we can count on you for an, a new review of the information related to the Nasser investigation, USA Gymnastics and USOPC to determine whether there are additional cases where prosecution is necessary to hold wrongdoers accountable. Um, the, the institutional failure that you speak of is quite apparent. I, 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 I thought that the testimony by the gymnasts was, as I said, heart-wrenching. Um, and they were courageous. Um, the FBI director has adopted all of the recommendations of the inspector general and is putting them into effect. And in addition, um, we have adopted new regulations, new authorities in the department to be uh, clear that if the FBI is investigating a, a case of, um, of, uh, of assault on a child and determines that uh, it no longer ha that it doesn't have jurisdiction. It immediately inform the relevant state or local uh, prosecutors and law enforcement. This is what didn't happen in the Nassar circumstance, and uh, ensure uh, that that um, um, uh, is done so that uh, the state and local uh, will be able to continue. Uh, likewise, with respect to transfers from one uh, FBI office to another, another failure uh, under those in that case that those be monitored to ensure that those transfers occurred. We take this extremely seriously. Uh, what happened is just awful. Um, 
and uh, you have the commitment of the Justice Department and of the FBI director and of the FBI to make these kinds of institutional changes to ensure that this doesn't happen again. I appreciate those points, but as you well know, because of your own long and impressive record as a prosecutor, there's nothing like accountability, individuals being held accountable to send a message, particularly a deterrent message, to an institution. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. And I have a list from the Republican side, and this is the order they've given me. Correct me if I'm wrong. Tillis, Blackburn, Hawley, and Cruz. We have two Democratic senators who have not asked at this point. We'll wait to see if they arrive. Senator Tillis. Senator Tillis, I don't know if your mic's on. Better? Better. Yeah. Uh, you may regret it. But, um, uh, Mr. Attorney General, thank you for being here. You know, in, in response to uh, the, the memo, uh, I, I know you've repeatedly said this is not about parents. Fifteen years ago, I was PTA president my daughter's high school. Uh, participated in a lot of school board meetings, and I still watch it on public access back in Mecklenburg County when I'm home. Um, the, the basis for your memo was substantially the letter that you all received. Is that correct? That was an important part of it, yes, Senator. Do you, uh, I mean, do you think there was an empirical, I, I've seen some of the widely reported uh, situations and uh, some school board meetings, but is there really any empirical basis for, I've seen a lot of raucous school board meetings. I've participated in them. Uh, is there really any empirical basis? Did the DOJ do any real work outside of the public reporting to say that there's a disturbing trend that required the kind of uh, what we consider to be overreach on, part, on behalf of the DOJ? So, uh, as I've explained, um, what we looked at was the letter for, um, from an organization that represents thousands of uh, school board members and school boards and public reports of um, threats of violence. And, and even since then, I have further read um, quite express um, uh, threats of violence well, it, being it, reported. It, Mr. Uh, but, Attorney General, I want to try and keep in time and deference yeah, to my, my colleagues behind me. But um, I, I do. I know that you've said it's not about the parents. Um, but when the DOJ releases the memo, and I think even more importantly, the, uh, the press statement, I think that it does have the, a chilling effect on parents being willing to go and express their concerns with the direction the school board's going. Uh, when all of a sudden you think that your words and this list of, of uh, crimes that uh, the department has sent, I guess, to at least the state of Montana, others, uh, it could have a chilling effect on people who legitimately have a concern they want to express it, but now they, they may think that they come crosswise with the FBI. Um, so I do believe that it will have a chilling effect on people whose right they have to go in, express their concerns, like a Loudoun County, a, a, a ridiculous overreach. Um, I think that it will have that effect because the full force of the FBI is now something a parent has to think about before they go before a school board meeting to express their concerns, and they get frustrated. Like I said, they've been raucous for decades, and they will be raucous for decades to come. Um, so I, do, I, I really do believe that you should seriously consider rescinding, revising uh, a statement out there that concerns me for the parents that I want to show up to school board meetings and have the school boards held accountable. The other thing that we should talk about are the numerous examples of school board members getting caught saying audacious, audacious things. There's one thing you've seen over the past year. Think about some of the provocative statements that they said. They thought they were behind closed doors, but they were on the Internet uh, basically ridiculing parents and uh, pretending like they had ball control over their their children's education and their future. Uh, we've got to get more parents engaged, and I think that the effect of the DOJ action is the exact opposite of that. But m most of my colleagues have covered my concerns, and I agree with uh, those that are expressed on my side of the aisle. In response to Senator Graham on immigration, uh, you said that you did go visit the border. It sounds like you were down there uh, mainly from the perspective of your role in the DOJ. I understand that Homeland Security is primarily responsible, but I would encourage you to go back down there and maybe uh, we could share with you our itinerary to talk about why I do believe it should be a great concern to the DOJ. We've got almost one and a half million asylum cases on the docket now, and it takes years to complete them. 
and about 80 percent of them are adjudicated as not having a valid, uh, a, a valid claim. So th doesn't that data lead you to suggest that the asylum system is being abused? I mean, just that, that's, that's data from the DOJ. So, Senator, I don't know for sure about the data, but the, the purpose of the of, 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 of asylum adjudication is to adjudicate asylum. Um, people well, I understand that, but, but allows them to make these. Uh, this is a statutory question. I'm not an attorney. Not Justice Department. I'm not an attorney. You're a, you're an accomplished judge. So I, I'm looking at this just from a practical standpoint. When the data says that over almost two million people across the border illegally uh, since January. And it is 80 percent likely that they're not going to have a valid asylum claim. How any reasonable person couldn't look at that and say something is being abused here. It's a gateway to get into this country, drift into these shadows and virtually never leave the country. But here's the one that I'm most concerned with and why I think a briefing with the, the same people that we met with at the border. Many of the people on this committee were there when I was hundreds of gotaways a day getting across the border. And gotaways are not the ones that, the, uh, that want to be processed through asylum. They want to evade detection. They want to drift in. How, how on earth can we assume that there's anything but a malign purpose for them trying to evade detection? Otherwise, you just get into the system. You're going to be here for years. You're going to abuse the asylum system. They're skirting it to the tune of a couple of hundred a night. And this has been going on for months. So now we have thousands of people who came into this country when the cartels set a pick. They'll send about 50 people over to engage the Border Patrol so that they can send another couple of hundred into our society. They're drug traffickers, they're human traffickers, they're gun smugglers, they're gang members, and they're coming in by the thousands every month. That is a DOJ problem. That is a crime in our communities problem. And it's actually making the Hispanic communities, the majority of which are coming over are Hispanic, those communities less safe. I would really encourage you to go back to the border and look at it from the perspective of your role as attorney general and the hundreds and the thousands of illegals who are coming across our border every day, many of them drifting in and evading detection and making our communities less safe. Um, I do have a number. I've got intellectual property, uh, a number of implementation issues that I'm going to submit uh, for the record. But, uh, Mr. Garland, we have a problem at the border, and the DOJ has to engage and recognize that part of that problem you're going to have to fix. We've got to stop the $13 million a day that the cartels are getting for human trafficking. That's a documented number. We've got to stop the tons of fentanyl and drugs that are poisoning an Amer Americans because we have an out of control border situation. This is a law enforcement issue. I understand it's an immigration issue, but we have to get you, I think, read up the same way that we were the last time we were at the border. I'd really encourage you to go back down there again, talk with the people on the ground and understand why this is going to make your job more difficult and it's already making America much less safe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me begin with a comment before I get to a few issues and a few questions, uh, particularly in light of uh, recent comments from some of my colleagues about immigration, migration, what is, what isn't happening. And I want to start by uh, recognizing Senator Coons' remarks earlier, uh, who asked you about what you're doing to address the backlog in immigration courts, right? One of the uh, best, most smart approaches to tackling Unlawful migration is to improve the effectiveness, the, efficient, the efficiency of lawful migration. Uh, it's not just investing in immigration courts, but access to counsel. And I just want to add that these are issues that my office hears about on a very regular basis. And so I was heartened that you'll be asking for additional resources uh, to address those issues. This is certainly an area where money is needed to improve the processing of immigration cases while ensuring due process. Now to my questions. Um, first, uh, a response that uh, I and several of my colleagues have been waiting on since April 15th, when I and seven other members of Congress sent you a letter concerning the department's funding and oversight of predictive policing tools. 
which are deployed by law enforcement throughout the country. As we highlighted in that letter, and I'm happy to provide an additional copy to you, we're concerned that the Department of Justice may be devoting precious taxpayer resources to ineffective tools and encouraging local law enforcement to also devote resources to unproven strategies. Worse still, those tools may be perpetuating a vicious cycle of discriminatory policing against historically marginalized groups. Because we have not yet received a response, we do not know, for example, what, if any, conditions there are uh, by the D Department of Justice on the agencies and departments who deploy predictive policing tools with the aid of federal funds. I find this unacceptable. So, Attorney General Garland, it's been over six months since our letter was sent to the Department of Justice, and we have yet to receive an official response. Can you explain the delay and when we can expect a response? I, I can't explain the delay. I don't know what, what the reason is, but I will immediately take this back and be sure that the Office of Legislation to your letter. Okay, we'll get you another copy of that letter before we uh, leave here today. Uh, next issue. Uh, as uh, most, I believe, we should all agree, we need an open and competitive economy that also works for workers. We talk a lot about uh, uh, entrepreneurism, capitalism, consumer protection, but we need an economy that also works for workers, and this demands the Department of Justice's attention to combat artificially suppressed compensation, employer collusion, and increasing inequality. You know, for example, non-compete clauses or no-poach agreements limit the ability of many workers throughout our economy to switch to better paying opportunities or start their own businesses in a number of sectors. Antitrust protection for labor organizing does not yet explicitly extend to gig economy workers who are classified as independent contractors by their employers and corporate consolidation can limit the pool of companies in a labor market competing to attract and retain workers. Attorney General Garland, what is the Department of Justice doing to ensure that there's competition in our labor markets, and is this yet another area where the Department needs additional resources to fulfill the mission laid out by President Biden? Uh, Thank you for the question. The Justice Department's Antitrust Division agrees, I don't know if you can hear either, uh, 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 agrees that um, uh, competition in labor markets is as much a part of the uh, antitrust laws as competition in product markets or consumer markets. We have uh, a number of investigations involved in those areas that you're talking about. We have a criminal case, all, all public, uh, on the no poaching issue. Um, uh, we uh, uh, brought uh, cases and investigations uh, regarding allocations of uh, labor markets. So I, th I think I can fairly say we agree with you. This is an area of concern, and it's an area of antitrust division focus. The antitrust division does need more money um, and more uh, uh, lawyers and uh, economists uh, and investigators. Um, it was down substantially. Uh, one of the lowest um, headcounts uh, in, in, in quite a number of years. We very much need to build that back, and that's why our um, uh, FY22 appropriations request asks for a substantial increase in money for the antitrust division. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I look forward to supporting those uh, requests for additional resources. Um, and uh, finally, in the time remaining, uh, yet another topic. Uh, earlier this month, this committee released a report detailing former President Trump's scheme to pressure the Department of Justice and overturn the will of the people who voted for now President Joe Biden so that he could serve again as president. The report outlined behavior that follows a pattern and practice of intimidation, coercion, and outright bullying uh, by the former president's administration. If we don't hold these bad actors accountable, we face the possibility of eroding public trust in our institutions. Americans are looking for accountability, and they're looking to you, Attorney General, as the leader of your agency to administer justice. My question is this. 
Are you willing to recommit yourself to pursuing every possible avenue and every possible lead for holding those accountable who have used public office to undermine and demean our democracy? So um, as a general matter, the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, I don't want to talk about specific investigations except to uh, point out what's already been stated publicly on the record, which is a component of the Justice Department, although an independent one. The Inspector General is um, examining the matters that you're, that, about which you're speaking. Um, and I have full confidence that he will advise uh, me and the Department uh, of what he finds, uh, and that we will then take appropriate action. Okay. Thank you. And just in closing, I would uh, hope that uh, that would include review and consideration of uh, uh, allegations documented in a recent Rolling Stone article uh, where uh, participation in the lead-up to January 6th and on January 6th was not limited to just White House officials but actual members of Congress as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, we're we're going to uh, recognize Senator Blackburn, then take a five-minute break, return, and we have Senator Ossoff, Senator Hawley, Senator Cruz. And I just say to the two or three members who have said they might be interested in a three-minute round, uh, please be here. You have to be physically present because this has been a long day for all of us who've stayed here most of the time, particularly for the Attorney General. So, Senator Blackburn, and then a five-minute break. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and um, General Garland, thank you for being with us today. I have to tell you that it is with much disappointment that I have watched the DOJ be so politicized. And the way things have been carried out, uh, when you look at the memo to parents, you've heard a lot about that today, and it's because we're hearing a lot about that. And I just have to ask you, I, knowing that you really helped bring to justice those that caused the Oklahoma City bombing, would you really honestly put parents in the same category as a Terry Nichols or a Timothy McVeigh? My God, absolutely not. Then why, why would you ever release a memo? I mean, did you write that memo? Did staff write that memo? What would have led you to do this. It is so over the top. Senator, there's nothing in the memo that, uh, that in any way draws any comparison, anything like that. This memo is about violence and threats of violence. It's not Sir, I have to tell you that that may be your opinion. And you know, many times perception is reality. And reading that memo myself, Tennesseans reading that memo, what they found in that memo, what they heard you say was if you show up and you question these school boards, you will be deemed a domestic terrorist. You could be investigated by the FBI. I mean, the FBI has a lot of other things that they should be focusing on, and the FBI should be there looking at issues like China. Now, the Knoxville FBI has been very concerned about China. Uh, so why, give me a little update. What's the status of the China initiative at DOJ? So, uh, Senator, we are, we regard People's Republic of China as an extraordinarily serious and aggressive threat to our intellectual property to our universities. Uh, okay, that's, our... you're stonewalling me on that. We all know they're an aggressive threat. We continue to investigate okay. the uh, uh, PRC efforts to... Um, Do you see them as an adversary? I see them as adversarial with respect to our um, uh, ransomware, with respect to hacking our... our okay. uh, with respect to counterintelligence, respect to counter espionage well, we in all those that ways. Over the last several months, the last nine months, several espionage prosecutions of researchers have been dropped. Our charges have been dismissed. 
including those of a UT professor at UT Knoxville. And of course, the Huawei case is there. So this is in spite of the fact that Director Ray recently testified that the FBI opens a new Chinese espionage investigation every 12 hours. So are there apparent failures of the initiative? Is it a lack of leadership? Or is it a compromise position with the administration? Is it incompetence? Uh, every case is evaluated on its own with respect to the law and the facts. Um, we continue to open cases uh, involving the People's Republic of China uh, daily, as the, as the director said. Uh, we will not in any way let up our concerns about okay. uh, uh, Chinese. All right. I want to move on. I'm glad to know you're not going to go soft on China because this administration is going soft on China. Uh, on your directive, going back to the school board, Association in the directive that you sent at the NSBA has apologized. Are you planning to apologize to the parents of this country, there moms and dads? There is nothing in this memorandum that any parent should be concerned about. Uh, there's a lot that parents should be in, uh, concerned about it. Let me ask you about the Durham investigation because 44 senators joined me in a letter that we sent to you uh, in August, and we still have not received a written response from you on the status of the Durham investigation. So will you provide for me a written status report of the Durham investigation? So the, the particular aim, I think, of the letter asked about the budget. And as I said at the House Committee, Mr. Durham is continuing. And the only we asked for a status update. Well, I, and we also ask that the report be made public, available to the public on the completion of his yes. work. Will that be made public? So on both of those questions, his budget has been approved, as okay. I already announced. And with respect to the report, I would like as much as possible to be made public. I have to be concerned about Privacy Act concerns and classification. But other than that, the, the commitment is to provide a public report, yes. Can you guarantee this committee that uh, Special Counsel Durham has free reign to proceed wherever his investigation takes him without any political or otherwise undue influence or interference. Yeah, there will be no political or otherwise undue interference. Okay, with Susan Hennessy. Investigation. She, okay. Susan Hennessy was recently hired to work in your National Security Division. This is a troubling hire because of her political bias. She has made several comments that show she is incapable of working impartially on sensitive matters within the National Security Division, particularly on the Durham investigation. For example, December 1st, 2020, Ms. Hennessy stated, and I am quoting, Durham has made abundantly clear that in a year and a half, he hasn't come up with anything. I guess this kind of partisan silliness has become characteristic of Barr's legacy, but unclear to me why Durham would want to go along with it, end quote. So how can the American people be certain that she is going to be fair and impartial when she is on the record making those statements? So has she retracted that statement? Do you intend to ask her to retract that statement? I have to confess, I don't think I've even ever met Ms. Hennessy, and she has nothing whatsoever to do well, with Well, you may want to look at her. She is there in your National Security Division, and she is very much opposed to this. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. I am going to send a couple of questions to you for more complete answers, but I associate myself with the comments by my colleagues that the border issues have turned every town into a border town and every state into a border state. The amount of drugs, the amount of trafficking that is flowing in here, talking to local law enforcement, the way they're looking at the cartels. Mr. Attorney General, there is a lot that needs to be done to secure this this country and the parents of the kiddos in our school, they are not the problem. There are other problems that need your attention. 
Thank you, Senator Blackburn. The committee will stand in recess for five minutes.
Ready to resume, Senator Hawley. Mr. Chairman, did you call on me or Senator oh, I'm Ossoff? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm happy to go. But I, I didn't see Senator Ossoff. I apologize. Senator Ossoff, then Senator Hawley. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Attorney General, nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Last week, the Senate passed legislation that I introduced alongside Chair Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley, the Prison Camera Reform Act, to reduce violence and civil rights abuses in BOP facilities by overhauling a security camera system that IG Horowitz has found is outdated, unreliable, as well as the means of preserving and recording the footage from those systems. Do you agree that these reforms are necessary and should this bill become law? Uh, will you commit to prioritizing the implementation of the requirements it imposes upon the BOP? Yes and yes. Thank you, Attorney General. I'd like to discuss with you uh, staffing issues at the Bureau of Prisons. Earlier this year, the GAO, which as you know is a nonpartisan independent watchdog, concluded that BOP lacks a reliable method for assessing the scope of staffing issues or the impact on incarcerated populations and staff of staffing issues at BOP facilities. Do you agree the inability to reliably measure this problem impedes BOP's <coughs> ability to address gaps, for example, shortages of medical staff, shortages of personnel who will help implement the First Step Act and anti-recidivism programs, as well as makes it more difficult for Congress to respond. And will you commit to working with my office to help identify where there's gaps in planning or budgeting or personnel management or the authorities that BOP has? Uh, yes, Senator. I, I met with the Comptroller General about this, uh, about uh, the various of his reports, and this one in particular. Um, and I agree this is a serious problem at the Bureau of Prisons. The Deputy Attorney General has been working on this problem um, for quite some time now, as she, she has uh, uh, repeat meetings with the Bureau of Prisons to go over this uh, issue with respect to staffing and assessment. Um, and uh, um, I'd be happy to have somebody uh, on our staff meet with your staff. Thank you, Attorney General. The in Inspector General uh, has determined that BOP lacks a clear and consistent policy for the use of solitary confinement in BOP facilities. Has BOP, to your knowledge, issued such a policy? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Will you work with my office to determine whether they have and what may need to be done to ensure that they do? Of course. Thank you, Attorney General. Question about commercial data and its use in DOJ investigations. In 2018, the Supreme Court issued its Carpenter v. United States decision that government agents must obtain a warrant before collecting cell phone data that showed the location of a device over a seven-day period. Of course, this data is widely available for many U.S. persons on commercial markets through data brokers and uh, other technology companies. To your knowledge, do any federal agencies currently purchase data or any DOJ components currently purchase data or contract for services that provide device location data from commercial vendors? Is this data used in investigations or prosecutions? Well, I, d I don't believe that we purchase location data, um, but um, I'll be happy to look into that and, and get back to that, uh, back to you on that as well. I'd be grateful because I think there are serious Fourth Amendment concerns there. I uh, would like to discuss the FISA process with you. In its report last month, the Office of the Inspector General noted that DOJ and FBI still had work to do to implement the IG's recommendations to strengthen the review process for FISA applications to ensure they contain accurate information. And while this has unfortunately become a partisan issue over the last few years, it's fundamentally an issue of privacy, due process, um, and the integrity of um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court and the applications it receives. The IG's report notes that the FBI has not significantly changed the process by which a supervisor, such as the Assistant Attorney General for National Security Division, reviews and documents the factual assertions made in FISA applications. And I uh, discussed this issue with Matt Olson when he was before the committee for his confirmation. So what steps is the DOJ taking to make substantive changes to the FISA review process and comport with the IG's recommendations? So I completely agree um, that this should not be a partisan issue. FISA, on the one hand, is an extraordinarily important tool for our ability uh, to protect the country against uh, foreign enemies. Um, and on the other hand, it's a tool that has to be dealt with with the most uh, extreme care 
because we have to protect uh, American uh, citizens uh, from uh, unwarranted surveillance, um, uh, non-judicial surveillance. Um, I take the um, Inspector General's uh, report extraordinarily seriously. I believe the one you're talking about, though, refers back to events uh, uh, from 2020 and 2019. But regardless, um, we take this very seriously, um, and the FBI director uh, does as well. Um, the National Security Division of the Department uh, reviews what the um, FBI is doing uh, with respect to FISAs uh, routinely, um, audits and analyzes them to be sure that they are uh, following uh, the, the correct rules, um, and we intend uh, to continue that kind of intensive review to ensure um, that uh, uh, the internal regulations and the requirements of the FISC uh, are maintained. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General. And uh, I believe there is, within the last couple of months, some additional recommendations or concerns expressed by the IG about the implementation of changes pursuant to his prior conclusions. So, uh, well, this must be the Woods. I think this is the Woods files that you're talking about. And, and again, I'm quite uh, that's correct. I, I, I quite agree uh, that uh, this has to be done better. That, uh, as I think he said, it's a work in progress. Uh, and there is certainly uh, 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 considerably uh, more room for improvement, and we are uh, focused on making those improvements. Okay. Well, please know that there's bipartisan concern about, about seeing those As improvements implemented. Um, final question for you about press freedom. Mr. Attorney General, you issued a memo in July prohibiting the Department from using subpoenas, court orders, or warrants to obtain information on the confidential sources of reporters. And this new policy, as you defined it, offers broad protections for members of the news media, but does not qualify uh, or define with specificity who qualifies as members of the news media. Um, is there a specific interpretation of that phrase that's been issued in internal department guidance? So the answer to that is no. Um, we have discussed this with representatives of the news media uh, continuously, and as part of our review for purposes of turning this memorandum into a regulation. We are continuing to discuss this. As you can imagine, it's very difficult to make that, uh, that kind of uh, definition. But very important to get it right. I, I, I completely agree. And uh, I think my staff will likely ask yours for a briefing on the progress of your deliberations and perhaps we'll weigh in. Thank you for your service, Attorney General, and for your responses, and I yield back. Thanks, Senator Ossoff. Senator Holy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Garland, on October 4th, you issued an unprecedented memo that involves the Department of Justice and the FBI and local school districts, local school boards, nothing like it in our country's history. It was based, you've testified, on this letter from the National School Board Association that we now know the White House was involved in writing. They've retracted the letter. They've apologized for the letter. They say they regret the letter, but you won't retract the memo and said earlier that you have no regrets, and you've defended yourself repeatedly today before this committee by saying, well, you're focused on violence. But now, of course, we've seen the memo from your own Justice Department advising state and local and other prosecutors about all of the different federal causes of action that they can bring against parents that are not about violence, they're about harassment and intimidation. I'm looking here at this memo. It identifies no fewer than 13 possible federal crimes involving harassment and intimidation, including making annoying phone calls. Do you think a parent who makes a phone call to a school board member that she has elected, that that school board member deems annoying should be prosecuted? General Garland? No, I don't. And the Supreme Court has made quite clear that the word intimidation with respect to the constitutional protection it's one that directs a threat to a person with the intent of placing the victim in fear of bodily harm or death. Prosecutors who investigate these cases know the Supreme Courts. This is a, a, a very famous uh, leading case. Pro prosecutors do, but, but parents don't, General Garland. Do you, do you think that a parent who looks at the 13 different federal crimes that your Justice Department has identified they might be subject to and prosecuted for, like making annoying phone calls, do you think that they're going to feel that they're welcome to speak up at a school board meeting? How about this one? They could be prosecuted for using the Internet, I guess that would be Facebook, in a way that might cause emotional distress to a victim. Is that a, is that a crime of violence? Senator, I haven't seen the memo that you're Why talking about. Why haven't you? And I don't, I, and I, I, even from the description, it doesn't sound like it was addressed to parents. But if you no, it was, wasn't addressed to parents. It was addressed to prosecutors. That's the problem. Why haven't you seen the memo? I, uh, 
I don't know why I haven't. I don't look at every. I have. I do not get every memo that every U.S. attorney uh, sends out. But uh, if you're wait, wait, wait a minute. Don't don't. I, I don't. I just want to be sure I understand this. This this is a memorandum that collects 13 different federal crimes parents could be charged with. It has United States Department of Justice on the top of it, and you're telling me you haven't seen it? Who's the memo from, Senator? The United States Department of Justice, United States Attorney for the District of Montana. I have not seen a memo from the District of Montana. I not have, high enough priority for you? It's not, that's not the question. I don't. It is I, the question. Answer my question. Is it not a high enough priority for you when you're threatening parents with 13 different federal crimes? I These aren't crimes of violence. You've testified today. You're focused on violence. That's not what your U.S. attorneys, they work for you. That's not what they're saying. You haven't seen it because it's not a high enough priority, or what? Question of priority. No one has sent me that memo, so I haven't seen it. What do you mean no one has sent you the memo? You run the United States Department of Justice, do you not? There are 115,000 employees of the Department of Justice. Indeed, and you are in charge of every one of them. And, and this was a sufficiently important case that you issued a memo. You, over your signature, issued a memo involving the FBI and the Department of Justice in local school boards, local school districts. Your U.S. attorneys are now threatening prosecution with 13 different crimes, but it's not a high enough priority for you. We got lost in the mix. I'll send again. I've never seen that memo. It wasn't That's what concerns me. me, General Garland. Well, it wasn't sent to me. I hope you will assure your constituents that what we are concerned about here is violence and threats of violence. That only leads That's me to conclude, way. General That's Garland, all I can conclude from this is either that you're not in control of your own department or that more likely what I think to be the case is that you knew full well that this is exactly the kind of thing that would happen. When you issued your memo, when you involved the Department of Justice and all of its resources and the FBI and all of its resources, in local school boards and local school districts, you knew that federal prosecutors would start collecting crimes that they could use against parents. You knew they would advise state and local officials that these are all of the ways parents might be prosecuted. You knew that that was the likely outcome, and that's exactly what's happened. And we're talking about parents like Scott Smith, who's behind me over my shoulder. This is a father from Loudoun County, Virginia. Here he is at a school board meeting. He was forcibly restrained. He was assaulted. He was arrested. Why? Because he went to an elected school board meeting. He's a voter, by the way. He went to an elected school board meeting to raise the fact that his daughter was assaulted, sexually assaulted, in a girl's restroom by a boy. This is what happened to him. Now, you testified last week before the House that you didn't know anything about this case. I find that extraordinary because the letter that you put so much weight on, the letter that's now been retracted, it cites this case. It cites Mr. Scott's case directly. There's a news article cited in the letter. It's discussed in the letter, but you testified you just couldn't remember it. Maybe this will refresh your memory. Do you think people like Scott Smith, do you think parents who show up to complain about their children being assaulted ought to be treated like this man right here? Parents who show up to complain about school boards are protected by the First Amendment. Do you think that they ought to be prosecuted they in the different ways that your U.S. attorneys are identifying? If what they're doing is complaining about what the school board is doing, policies, curriculum, anything else that they want to, as long as they're not committing threats of violence, then they should not be prosecuted, and they can't be. Let me ask you about this. Several of my Democrat colleagues have today, just today in this hearing, multiple times have compared parents who show up at school board meetings, like Mr. Smith here, have compared them to criminal rioters. You think that's right? You think that a parent who shows up at a school board meeting who has a complaint, who wants to voice that complaint, and maybe she doesn't use exactly the right grammar, you think they're akin to criminal rioters? Do you agree with that? I do not, and I do not remember any senator here compare, making that comparison. Oh, really? These people are just like the folks who came here on January 6th and in, in, in the riot at the Capitol? I don't think it, they were referring to the picture that you're showing there. Well, I certainly would hope not. They were referring to parents who go to school board meetings. Mr. Smith is a parent who went to a school board meeting. I'll leave it at this, General Garland. You have weaponized the FBI and the Department of Justice. Your U.S. attorneys are now collecting and cataloging all the ways that they might prosecute parents like Mr. Smith because they want to be involved in their children's education and they want to have a say in their elected officials. It's wrong. It is unprecedented, to my knowledge, in the history of this country, and I call on you to resign. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cruz. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For eight years under Barack Obama, the Department of Justice was politicized and weaponized. When you came before this committee in your confirmation hearing, you promised things would be different. I asked you specifically, quote, will you commit to this committee that under your leadership, the Department of Justice will not target the political opponents of this administration? Here was your answer, quote, absolutely. It's totally inappropriate for the department to target any individual because of their politics or their position in a campaign. That was your prom promise just a few months ago. I'm sorry to say you have broken that promise. There is a difference between law and politics. And General Garland, you know the difference between law and politics. Law is based on facts. It is impartial. It is not used as a tool of political retribution. This memo was not law. This memo was politics. On Wednesday, September 29th, the National School Board Association wrote a letter to the president asking the president to use the Department of Justice to target parents that were upset at critical race theory, that were upset at mass mandates in schools, to target them as domestic terrorists. On the face of the letter, the letter was in repeated consultation with the White House, in explicit political consultation with the White House. That was on Wednesday, September 29th, five days later. On Monday, so right after the weekend, boom, you pop out a memo, giving them exactly what they want. Now, by the way, I understand that. In politics, that happens all the time. An important special interest wants something. Sir, yes, sir. We're going to listen to them. Let me ask you something, General Garland. In the letter, which you told the House of Representatives was the basis for this abusive memo targeting parents, how many incidents are cited in that memo? I have to look back through the memo. Okay, I you, the you don't know. How many of them were violent? Again, the, the, the general report. How many of them were violent? Do you know? I don't know. You don't know. And there's a reason you don't know. Because you didn't care, and nobody in your office cared to find out. I did a quick count just sitting here. During this hearing, I counted 20 incidents cited. Of the 20, 15 on their face are nonviolent. They involve things like insults. They involve a Nazi salute. That's one of the examples. My God, a parent did a Nazi salute at a school board because he thought the, the, the policies were oppressive. General Garland is doing a Nazi salute at an elected official. Is that protected by the First Amendment? Yes, it is. Okay. 15 of the 20 on the face of it are not violent. They're not threats of violence. They're parents who are unhappy. Yet, miraculously, when you write a memo, the opening line of your memo, in recent months, there has been a disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence. You know what? You didn't look, and nobody on your, on your staff looked. Did you even look up the 20 instances? As I testified, the decision to make uh, the send a memo is for an assessment. Did you look up the 20 instances? I did not read. Did anyone on your staff look them up? I don't know the answer, but it's uh, not uh, But of course memo. you don't. In general, there's a reason. Look, you started your career as a law clerk to Justice Brennan. You've had many law clerks during the year, during your time as a judge. I was a clerk to Chief Justice Rehnquist. I'll tell you what, if I drafted an opinion for the Chief Justice and walked in and it said, there's a disturbing pattern of violence, well, Ted, how do you know that? Well, I got an amicus brief here who claims it. You would fire a law clerk who did that. You're the Attorney General of the United States. This was not a tweet you sent. This is a memo to the Federal Bureau of Investigations saying, go investigate parents as domestic terrorists. That is not what the memo says at all. It does it, not is it what the letter says? That is not what Is it what the letter says? I don't care what the letter says. You don't care. care. You said it was the basis of your memo. You testified under oath before the House of Representatives the letter was the basis of your memo. Now I mean, you don't care about the letter? The letter and public reports of violence and threats of violence. My memo says nothing about domestic terrorism, says nothing about parents committing any such things. My memo is an attempt to get an assessment of whether there is a problem out there that the federal government needs to... The letter on its face 
says the actions of the appearance could be the equivalent to a form of domestic terrorism. And that is wrong. And, and that... asks the president to use the Patriot Act in regards to domestic terrorism and directed it... at parents. And this note... was the basis of your memo. My memo. The Department of Justice, when you're directing the FBI to engage in law enforcement, you're not behaving as a political operative because a political ally of the president says, hey, go attack these parents because we don't like what they're saying. Department of Justice, you did no independent research on what was happening, did you? The memo has nothing to do with partisan Did you do independent research? The memo has Did you do independent research? The memo has nothing to do with You're not with answering that politics. question. You've testified you know nothing about the violent sexual assault that happened in Loudoun County, even though it's one of the bases in this letter. I read about it since then. Okay. You told the House last week you knew nothing about it. Not know at the time, no. Okay. This week, the court concluded that a 14-year-old girl was violently raped by a boy wearing a skirt in the girl's restroom. The school district covered it up, released the boy, sent him to another school where he violently raped another girl. The father who Mr. Hawley just showed you was the father of, of, of the first girl. He was understandably, do you understand why a parent would be upset when your daughter is raped at school, the school board covers it up and then lies to you and claims there have been no assaults, we have no instances of assaults in our bathroom, and that was a flat-out lie, as the court concluded this week. Do you understand why the parent would be upset? Absolutely, and is any expressions of upset are completely protected by the First Amendment. Except you just called him a domestic terrorist. I never called him that. That's not correct. This letter calls him a domestic terrorist. You based a direction to the FBI, an official direction from the Attorney General, on this letter. And I'll tell you what, the, the NSBA is so embarrassed of this letter, they've apologized for it and retracted it, but you don't apparently have the same willingness to apologize and retract what you did. Let me ask you something else. A big part of this, this letter is that they're upset about parents not wanting critical race theory taught. Your son-in-law makes a very substantial sum of money from a company involved in the teaching of critical race theory. Did you seek and receive a decision from an ethics advisor at the Department of Justice before you carried out an action that would have a predictable financial benefit to your son-in-law. This memorandum is aimed at violence and threats. I, I just violence. asked a question. Did you it seek an ethics? It has no opinion? predictable. Did you seek an ethics opinion? It has no. Did you seek an ethics opinion, Judge? You know how to ask questions and answer them. Did you seek an ethics opinion? You asked me whether I sought an ethics opinion about something that would have a predictable effect on something. This has no predictable effect in the way that you're talking about. So, if critical race theory is taught in more schools, does your son-in-law make more this money? Memo has not. If critical race theory is taught in more schools, does your son-in-law make more money? Yes or no. This this memorandum has nothing to do with critical race theory Will you answer or if you any sought an other ethics kind opinion? of curriculum. Will you ethics? answer if you sought an ethics opinion? I am opinion? answering the best I can. Yes Let's or no? Did you seek an ethics opinion? This memorandum has Did nothing... Did you seek an ethics opinion? This memorandum has nothing to do with... General, are you refusing theory? to answer if you sought an ethics opinion? I am telling you that there's no possible... So you're saying no. Just answer it directly. You know how to answer a question directly. I'm Did saying... you seek an ethics opinion. I'm telling you that if I thought there was any reason to believe there was a conflict of interest, I would do that, but I cannot Why do you refuse to answer the question? Why won't you just say no? I'm sorry. You're not going to answer the question? I'm sorry. Say, ask the question again. Did you seek an ethics opinion? I'm saying again, I would seek an ethics opinion in So no is the answer, correct? What? There was a Senator, your time is up. That the record reflect the Attorney General refuses to answer whether he thought, sought an ethics opinion, and apparently ethics are not a terribly high priority in the Biden Justice Department. I don't think that's a fair reflection of what I said. Then answer the question. Senator, you've gone way beyond any other senator's time. I think you ought to be at least respectful of other senators at this point. Mr. Chairman, do you know the answer whether he sought an ethics opinion? I think you have exchanged that so many times, we know where we stand. Now, uh, we have a request for three-minute rounds, and I have one from Senator Hirono and Senator Lee and Senator Booker. I'm sorry, and first, of course, Ranking Member Grassley. 
We're going to stick to three minutes. It's been four hours since the Attorney General has been in that chair with a couple breaks, and uh, I think we should try to wrap up if we can. A uh, request to put something in the record, a Wall Street Journal editorial titled uh, about the domestic terrorist uh, parents. The article notes that the October 4th DOJ memo should be formally rescinded. Without objection. Yeah. <clears throat> General, uh, after a great deal of pressure from victims in Congress, I know that you're taking another look at the department's disgusting decision not to prosecute employees for lying to government officials in the uh, Nasser uh, investigation. Do you anticipate that the department will similarly expunge the records of these employees just like McCabe or could or continue to give them out of, uh, get out of jail free cards as you've done so far? Um, uh, as I said, Senator, um we are reviewing um, the decisions uh, with respect to the false, uh, alleged false statements. That review is being done by the criminal division. Okay. Beginning in the summer of 2020, American cities began to see appalling and unprecedented spike in violent crime, murders, and gang violence as liberal politicians operated under the rallying cry of defund the police. This uh, uh, movement translated into over 1,200 deaths in 2020 alone. In the summer of 2020, then Attorney General Barr instituted Operation Legend as a way to combat the rising spike in violent crime. By any measure, this surge in federal agents was a resounding success. By December of 2020, over 6,000 arrests had been made. Over 2,600 firearms had been taken off our streets and approximately 467 people had been arrested for homicides. Given the clear success of Operation Legend, why is the department seemingly directing its efforts towards school board meetings, but not towards real threats or real acts of violence that happen every day in American citizens? So a simple question, does Operation Legend still exist? Uh, my understanding was Operation Legend was uh, directed at uh, violence over the summer of 2020. We have uh, addressed another surge of uh, federal uh, um, prosecutorial and law enforcement uh, efforts. Uh, this last summer, uh, we have um, uh, stepped up the amount of money we're giving to state and locals, and uh, we have increased our uh, joint task forces together. I've visited um, uh, federal and state law enforcement in New York and in Chicago and in Los Angeles and in San Francisco, all aimed at violent crime uh, in those areas, um, and we've asked for considerable additional money, uh, uh, about $1 billion in grants, uh, to fund the state and local police um, um, in FY22. So um, I think that's, I, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Well, only four packers, JBS, Tyson's, Cargill, and National Beef, control more than 80% of the cattle market. These companies hold a tremendous amount of market power. The Justice Department issued civil investigative demands in May 2020, but we've yet to learn anything from this investigation. Could you provide an update, and can you commit to expediting this investigation so that our cattle producers know whether there are any antitrust violations? So uh, I can't uh, uh, discuss the specific investigations. We have longstanding policies against that. But I can tell you that the Antitrust Division is aggressively concerned with competition in the market that you described. Um, we are also in cons uh, frequent consultation with the Agriculture Department with, the, with regard to the uh, Stockyards and, uh, and Pack Packers and Stockyards Act. We regard this as an area where we have to be uh, very much concerned about exclusionary behavior and anti-competitive behavior. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Hirono. Senator, I think your mic's not turned on. <laughs> One thing I have to say as we listen to, I don't know, going on uh, hour three is that the Republicans, once they um, focus on something, they just stick with it. Uh, it is amazing to me that there's all this mix mischaracterizing of the Attorney General's memo, as well as a letter from the acting you know, U.S. Attorney um, of Montana and his uh, letter is also totally mischaracterized as to 
what the focus of the Attorney General's letter is. So I would like to submit for the record the uh, acting attorney, U.S. Attorney of Montana's letter. Without objection. So as I said, it's pretty, um, it's kind of amazing, but not unusual that uh, my Republican colleagues will continue to focus on, on something that uh, the Attorney General has to continue to testify for the last three hours or whatever it is that uh, his letter is being mis mischaracterized. And they will focus on that until the nth degree at the same time you know, what is a real problem is the fact that we have 530 voter suppression bills that have been introduced in 47 states, the vast majority by Republican legislatures, and people's votes are literally being stolen through these voter suppression <laughs> actions. And do we hear word one about uh, the fact that this is happening all across our country, that voter suppression, stealing of votes is happening. Does a single Republican even care about that? No. So let's let that sink in. That they talk about all of these, the memos are totally mischaracterizing, and yet what is actually happening in voter suppression, not a peep. So I want to ask you, Mr. Attorney General, Shelby County, pretty much got, got it, the Voting Rights Act, and then followed by um, Brnovich, Brnovich uh, wherein the majority opinion suddenly comes up with all these guideposts that they now, that uh, the Justice Department now has to prove in order to protect our right to vote. So can you just tell us what the impact of the Supreme Court's Shelby County and Brnovich decisions have been on just the Justice Department's ability to protect our right to vote? And <laughs> is there something we can do? Are there tools that we can provide through congressional action that will enable you to protect our right to vote? Uh, yes, Senator. Um, the right to vote is a fundamental pillar of uh, American democracy. The Voting Rights Act is one of the greatest uh, uh, statutes that was ever passed. Uh, it enabled the Justice Department to protect people's uh, right to vote and uh, to prevent against discrimination based on race and uh, ethnicity with respect to patterns or practices um, with respect to voting. Um, in Shelby County, the Supreme Court took out the most important tool we have, which was Section 5, which allowed preclearance um, by the Justice Department or alternatively allowed the state to go to federal court to get uh, clearance. Uh, and, and that left us with the circumstance of having to examine each case uh, one by one with the burden on the Justice Department. So one thing that the Congress could do is uh, put Section 5 uh, back in place, as the Supreme Court indicated could be done uh, with the appropriate um, legislative record. Second, uh, Brnovich uh, interpreted Section 2, yeah. um, a statutory section in a way that the Justice Department disagrees with, as we made clear in our papers. I'm not saying anything we didn't say in our in our Supreme Court argument. They narrowed it uh, in a way that we uh, think was not consistent with congressional intent and which makes our ability uh, to challenge discriminatory changes in voting much more difficult. Congress could, again, uh, fix that by um, bringing back uh, Section 2 to what Congress intent originally intended and making that clear in statutory language. Both of those changes would be enormously important from the point of the Justice Department's success in protecting the right to vote. Thank well, you, Senator. I'm sorry. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Chairman, it's clear that we will have to do those things that the Attorney General recommends to protect people's right to vote without a single Republican going in that direction. That's how pathetic it all is. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Garland, I find it deeply concerning that you still haven't cited a single example of a true threat of violence. And if I'm understanding this correctly, and I've been here for most of this hearing, I've had to step out to vote a couple of times, but I think you seem to admit you didn't do any independent research outside of receiving the September 29th National School Board Association Letter. Now, one of the things I find that perplexing and quite troubling, this came in, uh, it, it was sent on September 29th, I believe that was a Wednesday, the following Monday, just 
days later, just barely over a weekend, you responded with your memo, relying on the NSBA memo. Now, I, I submit, as a member of the Judiciary Committee with oversight responsibility over your department, I submit requests for information all the time. Um, it takes time. I understand that. Sometimes it takes months to get a response back. I'm always grateful when I do get a response back, especially when it's a response that contains meaningful information. I understand people are busy and they've got a lot of stuff to comply with, but if, if one association can send one letter without any independent research on your part and within days, barely over a weekend, get not just a response, but an action memo signed by the Attorney General of the United States, I think that's weird. I think that makes me really uncomfortable, especially when the National School Board Association, as I understand it, or those associated with it, had publicly stated that they'd been coordinating with officials at the White House on this for weeks. It doesn't feel right. doesn't seem right to me. Now, last week, uh, two of our counterparts on our House Counterpart Judiciary Committee uh, asked you a little bit about uh, uh, the number of people entering the United States illegally. About 1.3 million uh, ha have entered the United States illegally this year. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. Of those 1.3 million, I'm quite confident, based on my own uh, past experience as a federal prosecutor, I'm co quite confident that some non-insignificant portion of those will have previously been deported. And as you know, under 8 U.S.C. Section 1326, that is a felony federal offense, illegal reentry after previous deportation. Since they've asked you about that, have you had a chance to identify how many prosecutions have been brought for illegal reentry this year? And uh, I, I'd be curious about that. And I'd also be curious as to whether there's anything analogous to your October 4th memo. Is there anything? calling out concerns that you've got over illegal reentry. So on, 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 on that question, the um, 1.3 million are arrests, I think, made by CBP. Uh, they are uh, referred, they are, uh, uh, CBP, make, the, the Customs and Border Patrol, makes a decision about whether to put those people into removal proceedings or to refer them uh, to the Justice Department for prosecution. We have uh, this year um, um, uh, charged thousands of cases, thousands of cases, criminal cases um, um, with respect to violations of the immigration laws with respect to uh, crossing of borders. I don't have the exact number. We can get you that exact number, but the number is in the thousands. My time's expired. I, I express the concern because w when the department becomes focused on things that are not part of its business, namely harassing, threatening, intimidating moms and dads in America, on chilling their ability to express their concerns to their neighbors, their friends, and those who represent them on a school board. They sometimes lose focus on the things that only the federal government can do, like controlling our border from the dangerous effects of illegal immigration generally and illegal reentry in particular. Thank you. So I take it Senator Cruz and Cotton are seeking three-minute rounds. Is that correct? All right. And Senator Booker as well. Senator Booker. The October 4th memo reads, in recent months, there's been a disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence against school administrators, board members, teachers, and staff who participate in the vital work of running our nation's public schools. Is that true? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I mean, it is true. It is true. I'm... I, I have a list of, of very disturbing incidents. In Texas, a parent physically assaulted a teacher, August 18th, 2021, in Pennsylvania, a person posted threats in social media which required pol uh, police to station outside of a school district. Law enforcement investigating the person. I could keep going. Ohio, a school board member was threatening a letter that began with, we are coming from you. Domestic terrorism in the United States, sir, has it been more from overseas radical terrorists since 9-11 or more from homegrown terrorists, most of them being right-wing extremists? Which has been greater since 9-11? I want to be careful about that. The, the, the threats uh, that we face uh, with respect to terrorism, and, and none of those descriptions have to do with terrorism, but the, the threats that we face in the United States come both from foreign terrorists. A church and in South Carolina, a synagogue in, Pens in Pennsylvania, a school, Parkland, a school, Newtown, 
Has there been threats and violence against schools in the United States of America? There have been, yes. Coming from what types of groups? Well, they come from domestic groups. From domestic groups. Yes. Has there been a long, pages long list of what my staff could grab, been threats and violence against school officials in the United States of America in the last year? I, I haven't, obviously haven't seen the list, but it accords with my recollections. Well, let me accord your recollection with the letter that I, I've heard so much about that I pulled it to read it. You say literally threats, excuse me, spirited debate about policy matters is protected under the Constitution. I'm quoting one of my colleagues today. Does that, does that sound like harassing and intimidating moms and dads? You affirm at the top of your letter that spirited debate is allowed. While spirited debate about policy matters is protected under the Constitution, that that protection does not extend to threats and to violence that we have been watching on our TV screens, intimidating people, threatening to hurt them, taking physical action. But you know what? You did not call for the DOJ and the FBI to monitor school board meetings, did you? No, I did not. You did not call for anyone to evoke the Patriot Act, did you? No, I did not. Sir, what you called is for the DOJ to convene meetings to discuss strategies for addressing those threats. That's correct. Is that intimidating moms and dads going to school board meetings? I can't see how that could be interpreted as a Sir, I know something about law enforcement intimidation. It stems from going up as a black man in America. I know what it feels like to be pulled over, to be accused of stealing things, to every time I drive over the George Washington Bridge as a, child, as a teenager, to know I had to put extra time because I was being pulled over by law enforcement. If someone's to read the actual letter, you are literally saying, as the leader of the highest law enforcement office in the land, that you protect spirited debate. That you think, though, given the climate of school violence in America, I've met with victims from Parkland. Mr. President, Mr. President I'm sorry. I, I have watched Republican after Republican go over time. And you're, I know you're gently banging that gavel, but I've watched all today. My colleagues violate what you said at the beginning was a strict time limit. And I would ask you to afford me two more minutes. Is there objection? No objection. Have you met with Parkland survivors? I met with survivors at the White House. Uh, and, um, uh, yes or I no? They, I think you the met with was, survivors of school violence. I I, have you? Have I, think you I met with the Parkland uh, families. Yes. Do you have a responsibility in a climate of threats and violence taking place at schools? Do you have a responsibility to convene strategy meetings to try to make sure we do not have eruptions? of violence in the country. Is that a responsibility of the federal government? Yes, our job is to protect Americans. Did you specifically say anything in this election, in this letter, that can be seen as harassing moms and dads and parents, or did you explicitly say that the Constitution protects spirited debate? I, sp I specifically said the Constitution protects specific, uh, spirited debate, and I don't believe there's anything this, in this letter that could be read to intimidate mothers and fathers. And I'm not talking about the outrage machines that seem to fuel our politics on both sides. I'm talking about the, the actual letter here, sir, that you wrote. You, you're a good-hearted person. Is there anything in this letter that could specifically lead a good-hearted parent who is against mask mandates, who somehow believes that the teaching of racial discrimination is repugnant to them, is there anything in this letter that would prevent them from going and speaking to it and yelling and being upset and letting their elected officials know what they really believe? Is there anything in the actual print of this letter that could be seen to that lead to that type of intimidation? 
No, Senator, all of those things are protected by the Constitution. Will you say that one more time? All of those things are protected by the Constitution. I, I hope that you will do your law enforcement work. There's too much violence in this country. There's been too many domestic terrorist attacks. I don't want to have the next hearing here be about some incident. I hope that you continue to convene your strategy sessions to protect parents and children and school officials from any kind of the heinous violence that we have seen way too much of in this country and that we all bear a responsibility for stopping. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the allowance of the extra time. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cruz. We talked just a minute ago about the difference between law and politics. We heard some impassioned political speeches, but also a question that just was asked by my friend from New Jersey. Is there anything in this memo to tell a parent that they're being targeted for harassment and intimidation? I would note that the letter from the school boards cited 20 instances, 15 of which were nonviolent. The letter from the school board described them as domestic terrorism. Within days, the Department of Justice snapped to the commands of the special interest and issued a memo, a directive to the Department of Justice and a directive to the FBI. This is, again, where law matters. The opening sentence describes a disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence. Now, you spent a long time as a judge when you have three things listed. Am I correct that anyone interpreting that, reading it, would conclude that harassment and intimidation are something different than threats of violence, given that you listed each of the three out separately. Is that consistent with the canons of construction? The memorandum is addressed to professional prosecutors. I asked you a question, not who it was addressed to. Senator, at least let him respond. No, not when he answers a non sequitur. If he, he wants to answer the, Okay, you're taking my time now. This is not coming out of my time. Listen. When I ask a question, you've given you more time than any other senator. Mr. Chairman, now listen. When I ask all I'm a asking question, is allow him to respond. Mr. Chairman, when I ask a question, he can answer the question, but he's proceeding to ask a total non sequitur. I asked about the canons of construction on the board. Uh, Please uh, let him respond. I'll ask the question again. Uh, the opening line of the memo specifies harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence. Is it correct under the ordinary canons of construction that a legal reader would understand that harassment and intimidation mean something different from threats of violence? Is that correct? A legal reader would know Virginia versus Black, the Supreme Court definition of intimidation, and a legal reader would know 18 U.S.C. 2261A, the definition of harassment. And, and would a parent? This was not addressed to parents. But you know, parents read it. You're the Attorney General of the United States. You said you can't think of anything harassing. You directed the G-Man, the FBI, to go after parents. All right, let's move on to a different topic. We've sadly seen that you are willing to use the enforcement power of the Department of Justice to target those who have political views different than you, even if it's a mom at a PTA meeting. Let's, let's try the other side. Are you willing to enforce the law fairly against people who are political allies of the president. At a Senate hearing in May, Dr. Fauci said, quote, the NIH has not ever and does not now fund gain of function research in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. That was under oath, under testimony. On October 20th, the NIH principal deputy director in writing directly contradicted it. Those two statements cannot be true. As you know, Section 1001 of Title 18 makes it, it makes it a federal crime to knowingly make false statements to Congress. Is the Department of Justice investigating Dr. Fauci for lying to Congress? And will you appoint a special prosecutor to do so? I'm going to say again, the memorandum that I issued is not partisan in any way. It has nothing to do with what I agree with or I don't agree with. I don't care whether the threats of violence come from the left or the right. Could you answer now, the question I asked? The second question. We don't comment on criminal investigations or other investigations. If, uh, well, well, amazingly, when it's the political enemies of the administration, you comment loudly in a memo. Let me ask one other question. Not asking, uh, you the, President asking. Biden recently said in a national town hall that police officers who decline to get vaccinated should be fired. Do you agree with President Biden on that? I think all police officers, look, I, I stood on the stage at the, uh, uh, at the um, mall 
um, where the 700 and some police officers died this year were commemorated. Let me, let me try again. Do you agree with the president? It's a yes or no. You've asked questions as a judge. You know how to get a yes or no. Do you agree with the president? Yes or no? A large percentage of the law officers who died this year died from COVID-19. Do you agree with President Biden that police officers who declined to get vaccinated should be fired? Yes or no? And if they had been vaccinated, they wouldn't have died. And so is that a yes? You do agree with the president? Police officer. In Chicago, a third of the police officers did not file their vaccination status. Do you think Chicago should fire fire a third of its police officers when murder rates and crime rates are skyrocketing. This is a determination that the city of Chicago will have to make. So do you agree with the president? The president said yes. Do you agree with him? You are the chief law enforcement officer of the United States. Do you agree with Joe Biden saying fire police officers despite skyrocketing crime rates? That is a question that is a one of state law there and will have to be decided by the state. You have no view on whether we should Senator, fire cops? Senator, your time has expired. Well, you used two minutes. No, I certainly did not. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you again for being here, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, I'm going to shift topics to uh, an issue that I know you're familiar with, the 9-11 families and the state's uh, secrets privilege. Um, and I want to just say that I was encouraged and pleased when President Biden issued an executive order requiring the Department of Justice to complete a review of documents sought by those 9-11 survivors. As you well know, they are in court now taking advantage of JASTA, the overwhelmingly approved measure that gives our federal courts jurisdiction over their claims for the harm they suffered when their loved ones were killed during the 9-11 attack. And I was glad to see that the FBI has released uh, at least one document on the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 deaths. Uh, I still uh, am focused on the state secrets privilege, the invocation of it in past years before this administration, the overuse of it. In fact, the Trump Justice Department failed to provide any meaningful justification for withholding these documents from the 9-11 families. And I think we see now that there was no justification. So I know the re department's review is ongoing and that uh, you will continue to disclose, I hope, as much information as possible, as swiftly as possible. Um, just to address the department's use of the privilege more broadly, uh, the memo requires the Department of Justice to provide periodic reports to Congress identifying the cases where the privilege is invoked and explaining the basis for invoking it. Uh, I sent a letter earlier this month to you about this reporting requirement because this committee has received only two reports in 2011 and 2015. And in the six years since, the Department of Justice has failed to provide such reports. Uh, just to come to the point, um, I, I am respectfully asking for a commitment that you will provide these periodic reports to Congress and review the Department's policies with respect to its invoking the state secrets privilege so as to comply with the 2009 memo. I may have gone too quickly over the various uh, actions of the department, but I'm referring to the 2009 memo, which requires those periodic reports. So in the eight seconds that I have left and yes, the answer to both questions is yes, we are currently reviewing that memo. And if anything, we're, we will strengthen it. And we do intend uh, to make uh, periodic reports. Uh, and it is not a periodic report to have not made a response since 2015. I assure you. So we, in, we intend to do that. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Cotton. Judge, I want to return to our exchange this morning. As I've reflected on it, you made a shocking admission. You issued this memo direct or sicking the feds on parents at school boards on Monday, October 4th. You acknowledged that there was no effort in the Department of Justice, no initiative to draft this memo or create these task forces before Wednesday, September 29th, when the National School Board Association issued that letter. Is that correct? I don't know. 
All I know is that the first time I started working on this was after receiving the letter. That's all I that's So, so from your standpoint, there was, you were not aware of any effort in the Department of Justice before that letter was sent on September 29th. I think it's fair to say, as you're suggesting, that this letter and what uh, the other public notices of um, violence uh, against school board members and teachers are what form the basis for this uh, memo. This memo, yes. this memo is dated October 4th with your yes. signature on it. Did you sign it on October 4th? I did. So four intervening days, two of which were weekend days. Yes. I'd say that sets a land speed record for the federal government. When, when we Chuck get... Grassley pointed out that you have not responded to letters of his that have been outstanding for months. How is it the Department of Justice was able to move so rapidly on a single letter from a special interest group that has now repudiated that letter, said it regrets sending the letter, and apologized to its members for sending the letter. How did your department move so fast on this matter? When, I, when I, uh, an organization that re represents thousands of school board members... I would say they purport to represent thousands because state school boards across the country have been repudiating them and trying to withdraw their membership. That's why the National School Board Association withdrew its own letter. Who brought this to your attention? May I answer the question? I'm asking you a question now. Who brought you, this to you your attention? You asked a question. May I answer the question? The question is why speed? The answer is when we get reports of violence and threats of violence, we need to act very swiftly. I would have hated it to have gotten this letter and then acts of violence occurred in the interim before we were able to okay. act. Okay, the Judge. The only act here is assessing the circumstances. That's all there is here. And we can't wait until somebody dies. That's Judge, why we did this. Okay, well, you keep citing media reports. There were 24 incidents in that letter. As you've heard today, almost all of them were nonviolent. Those they are not the media reports I was referring to. Uh, you said earlier it was news reports. Okay, what other reports that you saw about potential violence at school boards were you basing this memo on? I don't on? recall them specifically, but I have now again seen since that time people saying Who? that they're repeating what they have said before. That's a, but that's but all post hoc. It's all after the fact. It doesn't, matter, doesn't go into your, mind, they, your frame they, of mind on October 4th. Who brought this to you? Who brought this memo to you and asked you to sign it? I got nobody it, brought the memo to me and asked well, me to sign someone it. had to bring it to your attention. Hey, judge, we're about to sick the feds on parents. I'm sorry, no one said we're about to sick the feds. Someone on parents. brought this. That's not an was accurate this, Was this an initiative of Lisa Monaco? This memorandum was uh, went through the normal processes within the department, and I worked on it myself. The, and someone is signed. a proponent. Someone was a proponent. You, I bet you didn't write the first draft of this. Where did it come from? I didn't did it come write from the Lisa first Monica draft, Hall? but I did work on this memorandum, and it represents my views, and it represents it, my reading of the materials. Did it come from Vanita Gupta's office? I'm not going to discuss. Is this Matt Clapper's initiative? I'm not going to discuss the internal workings of the Justice Department here. This memorandum respects my reflects my view, and I stand behind it. Are, and I continue to stand. Are you are you, are you aware of the Are you aware of conversations between members of your Department of Justice and the White House leading up to that letter? I am the school sure board there were convers there were no conversations with me. I'm sure there were conversations. It's perfectly appropriate when the White House receives a letter calling for law enforcement response across the board, not with respect to a specific case for the, for the White House to have conversations with the Justice are you, are you aware of conversations between your Department of Justice officials and White House officials and the members of the School Board Association all cooperating together, which is why you were able to move in four days, Judge, four days, two of which were weekends? As I said, I am sure there were conversations with the White House. I have no idea whether there were conversations with the School Board Association. Well, I, I bet we're going to find out if there were, and if it doesn't happen now, it'll happen in 15 months when Republicans are in charge. Well, of there's nothing wrong with there being such conversations. Let me be clear again. This is not a request to investigate any particular pro person or prosecute any particular pro person. In the same way you ask me to worry about violence in the streets, it's perfectly appropriate for the White House to urge me to worry about violence in the streets. Same way they're perfectly appropriate for the White House or any other organization to urge me to worry about election threats. There's nothing that I know, knew about this organization to suggest that it is in any way partisan. It's a National School Board Association. I certainly never, in my mind, viewed that as a partisan organization. And but now that they've repudiated their letter, why won't you just say you made a mistake? Because they didn't why would you say you made a mistake and you relied on bad information? Be because they didn't repudiate their letter. They repudiated language in the letter which I did not adopt and don't agree with. But their concerns are about safety in the schools and, and about violence. And this is a core concern of the Justice Department. That's why.
Thank you. Uh, Senator Blackburn has asked for three minutes, and I will conclude with my own three minutes after that. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Garland, you just told me that you don't think you ever met Susan Hennessy. Did you hire Susan Hennessy? I, I, you know, I, I, I have sign-off authority for everybody, I, I suppose, in the Justice I, Department. Not, have but you the had pre, but, uh, um, but, uh, Okay. That's the best I can answer with respect to that. But oh, the question okay. you were worried about, Senator, and I understand had to do with Durham. And as I explained, she has nothing to do with the Durham investigation. Okay. Were you unaware of her comments before you hired her? Again, uh, the, the, you don't know. I hire okay. 115,000 people in, in the Justice Department. I, I'm I don't fully know. aware of, of that. Uh, and it's amazing to us that those 115,000 people can't investigate things like crime on the border, uh, can't investigate crime on the streets. Um, and, you know, the, I'm going to return to this memo of October 4th. The memorandum cites harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence. And what I'd like to know is who chose that language, harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence. You've said this reflected your views, but it's become apparent that you did not write this memo your, yourself. So um, I, I would like to know who came up with that language. Was that yours or was that submitted language? So I, I, I don't know whether, um, uh, let me put it this way. This is language that um, law enforcement officers are very well understand. It is contained in the federal okay. statute. Okay, well, in the House in the Judiciary Committee opinion. last week, you said you were concerned only about true threats. Yeah. So are you going to revise your memorandum to make it clear that you this applies only to true threats of violence. Instead of classifying parents in this country with domestic terrorists such as Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols. The other thing I would like to know, you said to me earlier that uh, your memo was based on the NSBA letter and the news reports. Um, so you've said there was not a lot of independent research done by you and your staff. So if you would please submit to us for the record the news reports that you're referencing so that we will be able to have that as a frame of reference. And also, uh, we would love to know who actually did write that memo and how they came up with the idea of calling parents a domestic terrorist. One other thing I've got for you. Do you agree with the Supreme Court that the Second Amendment is a civil right? And if so, what is your civil rights division doing to ensure it is being protected? So just to back up on some of the questions, the memo okay. doesn't say anything about domestic terrorism or calling parents domestic terrorists. I do agree the Second Amendment is part of the Bill of Rights and, and, and uh, is therefore a civil right. Uh, the, the Civil Rights Division has some generalized authorities, um, but it also has specific statutory authorities. I don't know whether there is a specific statutory authority with respect to the sub Second Amendment that has been given by Congress uh, to the Civil Rights Division. I, I'm not aware of one. There may be, but I'm, I'm not aware of it. Okay, so we can depend on you and your Department of Justice to stand in support of the Second Amendment. Is that what you're saying, to defend it? Yes, of course. Okay. The Second Amendment Thank is you. part of the Bill of Rights. It's what we would like to know, and I'll look forward to the other submissions in writing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Um, Mr. Attorney General, thank you for your patience. You have been sitting in that chair with a couple of breaks for four and a half hours. Many of these colleagues of mine have had ample opportunity to ask questions and then come back and ask some more, sometimes the same questions. I would just like to make this observation. I understand completely why you issued that memo. And I wish my colleagues would reflect for a single moment as to why that memo is important, not just for school board members, but to send a message across America that there's a line we're going to draw when it comes to political expression. When you say words, when you wave your arms, that's all protected. But when you threaten someone with violence or engage in acts of violence, that is never going to be protected and shouldn't be. 
It isn't that long ago that Gabby Giffords, one of our colleagues in the House, was gunned down in Arizona. Her husband is now serving as our colleague in the United States Senate. I don't know the political bent of the person who shot her. It's basically irrelevant. But we should never countenance that as adequate or proper political expression. Steve Scalise, the Republican congressman from Louisiana, was gunned down on a baseball practice field by someone from my state who I believe was identified with the left in politics. It doesn't make any difference. It was an outrage that that good man has suffered as much as he has because of it. And now we have the story in Great Britain, David Amos, who goes to a town meeting and is stabbed to death in his constituency in England. For goodness sakes, can't we, even if we disagree on issues to a great degree, agree with the premise that anyone who engages in violence or threats of violence has stepped over the line, whether they come from the right or the left. I think that's what you were trying to say in your memo about the school boards. And like you, I have never heard the school board association identified as a great, strong special interest group. I haven't seen that in the years I've been in Congress. And there are many great, strong special interest groups. I would just say to you, Thank you for doing that. It was the right thing to do. It has been mischaracterized and distorted, not only today, but since then. But I think we can prove uh, by our actions that we are not trying to stifle free speech, but only saying to people, we're going to draw a line. I, was, I found it fascinating that at least one of the people who was criticizing you today and, and talking about the situation on January 6 was actually cheering the demonstrators on on January 6. And there's ample evidence of that. Uh, I, I, would, I would think we've got to draw a line that accepts in this civilized society we are going to be respectful of one another even if we disagree politically. I thank you for your testimony. Would you like to have a closing comment? No. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate what your remarks, though. Thank you. Thank you very much. The committee stands adjourned.